just for the record, I didn't hear any of that intro music, so I had no idea we were being intro. So welcome. It's time for the Sunday show. How's everybody doing? I'm Matt Delaney. Joining, this, joining me this week, no illusions. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. I mean, I'm a little nervous now because it's an amazing guest and great conversations, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> that, that's for other weeks. So. Oh, okay. All right, good. And well, that was a lot of pressure to throw on me at the last second. Yeah, I don't want to throw any pressure on you at all. Uh, this is a live call-in show here on the line. Uh, today's May 28th, 2023. You are all welcome to call in. Generally, we'll always prioritize theistic callers. So get your pastor to call in, get your grandma to call in, uh, get your uncle who's racist and awful and thinks Jesus wants him to be that way, get him to call in and get any of those people to call in and explain what they believe in why, maybe have uh, some way to convince us of that. But we will also take calls uh, from atheists as well. It's just that theist callers are always going to have priority uh, here on the Sunday show. Jimmy is out on vacation this week, and I, I, I couldn't be happier uh, that he's getting time off and that I get to hang out with Noah. So yeah, how you? I know you've been busy with uh, Zelda. Is, is anything yeah. else in your life right now? Uh, not at all. Well, it's, so I'm getting work done on my kitchen, which has been really awkward because I took a week off of work to play Zelda. So the whole time I was playing a video game 14 hours a day in my pajamas, there was these three guys working really, really hard on my kitchen the whole time and uh, really exacerbates how lazy I felt throughout. I remember a few years ago, like right after uh, Beth and I split, I took a, uh, when Red Dead 2 came out, I basically mm -hmm. parked my butt. I moved my recliner from where my, my living room is normally set out with like two little couches and my recliner's at an odd angle. I moved it directly in center, six and a half feet from the big screen TV uh, with my uh, little vape and a big glass of iced tea and whatever snack I had. And I sat in that chair for almost two weeks straight. And I thought, this is, this is the life. And then... Um, when I had my, uh, heart surgery and had to get stuck in that same chair for a couple of months, uh, yeah, it, there's a limit to how long I ever want to sit in that chair again. Yeah, no kidding. Well, see, it's, it's terrible because nowadays the game console will tell you how many hours, like when I was a kid, you just had to guess, oh, I've played for a few hours. Now I know I've played 160 hours of Tears of the Kingdom in the last like whatever 16 days that it's been out. Um, so, and I would rather not have that information, man. Mostly I want information. That's information I don't really need. I watched, um, I didn't, I didn't watch the whole thing. I'm not too bothered by spoilers in a, in a game this big. I know where the story is going. Uh, I don't need to see the end fights or anything else, but I did watch a good chunk of the current world record or the, what was the current world record speed run for tears of the kingdom. Uh, which was like an hour and nine minutes, but I saw that somebody else just posted one today of an hour and six minutes. And oh, wow. you got to figure for a game where the first 10 minutes is an unskippable kind of intro sequence. Uh, that means the actual gameplay from the second you hit that first island to the end is like an hour. Yeah. I spent that much time running around looking for a Hyrule pinecone. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, it, the game is really built for speed runs. It's interesting that it's built for speed runs, but it's also built like, you know, to, to spend 250 hours in. Uh, it's, it's really hard to hit that balance. I think they nailed it. Though. All right. Well, since this isn't the Zelda show uh, and we do have one caller on the line, I'm going to go ahead and start taking calls right now. Everybody else, you can go ahead and get your call in right now. I know we're, we're uh, working on potentially some audio issues and stuff like that. But as a reminder, there's always going to be a slight delay. Uh, this is just the nature of doing audio video stuff on the internet. Uh, there's a little bit of overhead involved. I'm going to do or try to do a better job than I often do of hitting the mute key just so that we can ask clarifying questions. For all the people calling in, what we want to know is what do you believe and why? Uh, be willing to have a discussion, be willing to defend your views. And if you don't feel like you're getting through today, uh, in a way that is uh, conducive to you being able to present your case entirely. We just started a new program that we are taking applications for called Inboss, where you will be able to come in and get 10 uninterrupted minutes to present your case, followed by 30 minutes of questions from the audience addressing the claims that you make, and 10 minutes 
by the end boss, whoever that may be. It's going to be me at the beginning. But I mean, if we have different topics, somebody else will be your end boss. I started this because I got tired of apologists acting like I was the end boss of atheism when I'm not. And I was like, all right, fine. I'll just lean into it and we'll, we'll make an end boss show. But yeah, that 10 minutes of question, and you will get the last word. But one of the key things you can do to make sure that you are selected for that show, because it is an hour-long show where we're picking um, someone who's not one of us to come in and basically be the guest that runs the gauntlet. One of the best things you can do to facilitate being selected for that is to call into this show and other shows here on the Line Network, and I'll get you a list of those shows as well shows as well, where you can present part of your case, have a conversation, and show that, yeah, you would make a good kind of debate like uh guest as well so starting off today we have joshua pronouns are he him in portugal uh wants to talk to us a little bit about how to explain atheism to someone who's a jordan peterson fan so joshua welcome to the sunday show on the line hello hello, hello matt hello uh how are you doing i'm doing well how are you i'm doing fine sorry i'm a little nervous I just expect to get called home today. <laughs> ah, you'll be fine. Anyway, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I know it's a really specific question, but I was just curious because she's a really big fan of Jordan Peterson, and I've tried to explain it before, but I just don't think she understands when I explain it. <clears throat> Do you, can you tell us specifically oh. what, what the hang-up is or, or what she doesn't understand? Well, the thing is, she doesn't understand what an atheist is, because <clears throat> when she said it, she basically says that atheist is a form of religion, basically. So atheists are no different from, say, Christians or any other form of religious group, basically. And I tried to explain that atheism doesn't, isn't a religion because it doesn't believe in anything specifically. It is a disbelief. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that she's a big fan of Jordan Peterson and tends to use his, like, like how I remember your debate, I, I wouldn't say debate, discussion with him, and she tends to use similar language to his, that no, no person's a real atheist, if you know what I mean, Matt. Well, I, I've certainly heard that before. I think one of the things is that for the people who are going down this line of atheism is just another religion, that's wrong, but so what if it was uh, that whether mm -hmm. or not you categorize it as a religion uh, is irrelevant to what we're actually talking about here and we have to remember that in in most cases what we're saying is we're we're, we're coming up with a label to describe someone not believing something and you don't uh -huh. have a name for people who don't believe in the loch ness monster or people who don't believe in bigfoot and so that's Correct. that's a really curious position that people don't really grasp they're they're absolutely going to run down this line of oh you must be claiming that there is no god which is is fine you can do that when when you talk to her and you say well what what's it, can you give an example of where the definition or understanding of atheist is relevant to some discussion you're having with her Hello. Oh no! Did Apologies, we lose Josh. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I, I tried to bring up the differences between uh, uh, agnosticism and atheism, but I tried to also say that there are people who are, say, agnostic atheists and anti-theistic atheists. If you know what I mean. Sure. But, but she said that you cannot be an agnostic atheist because they are different because they contradict one another like i tried to explain to her that have, have this have this have this expert call me because oh, it's really okay. frustrating i mean when when people just say oh these two labels are are in conflict okay if the labels are in the way get rid of them the fact of the matter mm -hmm. is i don't believe mm -hmm. a god exists Mm -hmm. is she saying that when I say I don't believe a God exists, that this just isn't true, that I am either lying or, um, or I secretly believe and don't know it? More like that, because I don't believe in a God, it's uh, like another form of religion. 
basically. I don't, I don't, but so I, I don't care about that. Okay. Then it's more well, so like the long she doesn't. Yes. Sorry, I, 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 as my friend and co host Heath Enright is fond of pointing out, uh, when they say it's just another religion, are they saying that religions are bad or bad ways of uh, no, assessing? That's the, that is, you know, more like atheists have a belief system like a religion does, like religious right, leaders what, and all that. Right, mm -hmm. but what I'm saying is, 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 is that a concession that that's a bad way of looking at the world, of, of viewing the world, religion? No. Right? When no, they no, say no, it's I, just another no, I, religion, that unless you're, unless you're accepting that religion is a derogatory comment, I don't see how that really affects the larger conversation that you're having about whether a god exists or, or whatever that conversation is. Yeah, but, but, she can, but I tried to explain to her and she just kept mislabeling it, and no matter how much I tried. <laughs> so you... You also say that if I'm if I'm misremembering this, I, my apologies. But she's no, saying it's just another religion, but she's also saying nobody's really an atheist, right? Yeah, yeah, she's basically saying that. So what could she describe this religion that people aren't really a part of, but think they're a part of? More or less. No, no, no. I'm saying, what what is this no. religion that that she's saying? Is just another religion, but nobody's actually a part of it. I don't understand that. I, I yeah, yeah, I had a hard time. I think she was just saying that we just actively don't believe in a god, but we know that there is a god. Like a friend basically okay. says, says so, yeah. So, so Joshua, if she's going to yeah. pretend that she knows what's in my mind better than I do, she can go fuck herself. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean. There, there's a limit, and, and I, I, I would love to find a way. You can have her call in, but when, when people start telling me, it's like, it's like the, I hate to keep bringing this up because it's been a topic several Probably. times in the last couple of weeks. But recently, Probably. somebody came after me uh, again with regard to trans rights issues and everything else. And the, the one thing that they love to do because they're all homophobic um, is say things like, one of the guys just posted, "You're gay, homie." And I'm like, okay, that, that's just weird to me because if I were gay, I wouldn't have any problem saying it if I were bi or pan or whatever else. But I don't care what the labels are. But when somebody mm -hmm. just asserts that they know my mind better than I do, um, mm -hmm. what else am I supposed to say other than what number am I thinking of? Fair enough. Well, yeah, because once you, once you reach that point in the argument, what they're saying is that what you say in the argument isn't going to affect what I believe. I know better than you what you believe. So what 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 what, what are you doing being in the argument in the first place? Right? What what purpose could you possibly serve? True. Yeah, I can actually see your point now. It, I can actually see it. As you're describing a little bit of what happens in these conversations, Joshua, it sounds like you keep getting to a point where what she seems to be saying is, nah uh. Oh, atheism is yeah. this. Nah uh. Ag agnosticism is this. Nah uh. And nah uh <laughs> yeah. isn't an argument and it isn't an evidence. And so, in the same way, and I would remind her of this, I can talk about Christianity. And I can talk about Christianity with some level of expertise, having spent a couple decades as a believer and many additional decades studying it as well. Wow, how wild is it that I can stack up five decades now? But it's uh, this notion that I don't get to decide what is or who is a real Christian. I fully acknowledge that. If somebody tells me I'm a Christian and this other person isn't, I'm like, I'm willing to accept that you both are because that other person could say that you're not and they are. I don't get to decide uh, who is or isn't a Christian. I can tell you who I think should qualify. I mean, if you say, hey, I don't believe in God at all and I don't really care for the Bible and I don't care for the character of Jesus uh, and I really like crystals and I think this crystal necklace makes me a Christian, I can be... Uh, that's not in the same ballpark as any version of, you know, Orthodox Christianity or anything substantive. And I think if you went around and talked to different Christian groups, they would all look at you uh, as, as if you've got three heads. But at the end of the day, all I can do is describe Christianity from a normative sense and from my history with it. And if I'm willing to do that as an atheist, 
and somebody mm -hmm. else i'm assuming she well i'm assuming she's not an atheist and yet she's willing yep. to make pronouncements about who is and isn't an atheist and what atheism is and isn't why, why does she get to make those decisions and declarations when we couldn't do the same thing to her a fair point i think i thank you that was i see i really don't have anything to add on to that because you actually made a good point matt <laughs> well you know the sun shines on a dog's ass sometimes i'm gonna get it right once every now and then <laughs> yeah and, and, I, so and I have to say that okay. when you're debating somebody and the argument becomes about uh, definitions and they're arguing with you about what the definition means it, you almost as as matt said you want to sweep aside the definition or the, the the term then all right let's imagine a new term and let me imbue it with meaning so that we can have a discussion right like if you if, if there's too much baggage coming with, with with the word atheist let's just make up a word for the purposes of this conversation and that means the thing that i say atheism means right yeah. and then you don't have to admit anything do, but we can still have that conversation. But if they refuse to accept the definition that you're using, you can't have a meaningful discussion. Okay, so it was basically a fruitless discussion, basically, if I'm saying correctly, well, if you if I understand correctly. It, it can be. One, one thing to remember, Joshua, is that the, the way we the way we operate as human beings is we're, mm -hmm. we're unlikely to change our mind on something that we've agreed to unless we are challenged and challenged in the right way and perhaps more than once. We know that people mm -hmm. uh, will double down even when faced with evidence that, that un unequivocally contradicts their, what their position is if they've made a public profession of it. So it's a little harder when somebody says publicly, you know, put, put, put themselves at risk saying, oh, I'm a, a Christ follower or I believe that vaccines cause autism. And then you show them the, the science that says, no, in fact, yeah, that's not the truth yeah we also know I, that the first time mm -hmm. someone hears something that that is that is a, a significant departure from what they believe uh the first time mm -hmm. you hear it it's just weird and you just kind of dismiss it out of hand and the second time you hear right. it your brain kind of does this hey i think i've heard something like that before and it's not until the third time that maybe there's a pattern there and so while your conversation with her may in fact be fruitless now you may be planting seeds mm -hmm. that allow another conversation with somebody else to be more fruitful or a future conversation with you. So it's not like it's a waste of time for a number of reasons. One, you may be um, planting ideas that that she can grow and, and recognize later. And number two, you're getting practice at it so that maybe you can be somebody else's second or third uh, you know, kind of key, key point. Okay. Yes, I, I can see that. That, thank you, Matt. Absolutely. And Thanks, Joshua. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the weird question. It was just like I, I was a little nervous, so I didn't know how to put it better. <laughs> no, it's fine. First it's time. one of those things. Uh, we we saw the the note beforehand, and the first thing I told Noah was like, well, he's asking about how to d explain atheist to someone who's a fan of Jordan Peterson. That's a very peculiar and specific m market. So it's nice that you were talking about a single person. Yeah, because she's like she's a big fan, and it's hard to. I've, it's basically difficult for me to. Well, I wouldn't say it's just tricky, more say. <laughs> yep. But yes, all right. Thanks, thank Joshua. you so much, Matt. I appreciate it. Whoops, uh, I clicked. I clicked drop while he was still saying thank you. But enjoy the rest of your Sunday. As a reminder, we are a live show here on the Line Network, and there are a number of other different shows that air on the Line Network as well. Um, for example, Mondays is always Skep Talk. And while Monday was supposed to be a different Skep Talk, that has now changed. I will be doing Skep Talk with Paul Agia tomorrow. Uh, let me tell you, uh, I, I, I love getting to work with Paul. It's so cool that we're going to get to do a Monday Skep Talk because I haven't actually uh, had a chance to dig in on that show yet. On Tuesday, uh, another episode of Dying Out Loud, this time with Aaron Lewis, who was my guest last week on The Hang Up on Wednesday. Um, I will have apostasy, uh, Stacy apostasy on the hang up this coming Wednesday and Katie and Ben will be back again on Thursday for another transatlantic call in show next Sunday. We return to the normal, uh, normative, uh, maybe typical 
I don't know, Sunday show with myself and Jimmy. Uh, all of these are call-in shows, as are all the shows on the line. And while we've got at least one caller on hold right now, um, the number to call into the show is 720-619-2288, or you can do it online through callinstudio.com slash show slash uh well it's the link is down below it's just a little longer than i can actually uh show slash the line there we go and that'll ask you for your name your pronouns your topic your question um yeah let me let me ask you real quick now before we get on to the, to the next caller setting aside the notion that we're talking about someone who's a jordan peterson fan or has acquired some confusion through some mess um, we kind of hashed out the let's throw the labels out if they're getting in the way and actually have a, a conversation about uh, what we mean. What has been mm -hmm. in your interactions with not not prof necessarily professional apologists, but I mean, just the average theistic apologist who seems to be coming up against a non-believer for the first time? Is there something that's been you've experienced it's like repetitive and particularly frustrating that's been like ah oh, every time it's this or th this happens so often that it, it annoys the crap out of me or i wish i had a better answer for her. um i don't know that um <clears throat> there's anything that i wish i had a better answer for there's a lot of stuff i wish they had better questions for you know um i find a lot of the times they ask me things that are so basic and silly that it's like Oh man, I studied anti-apologetics for this, you know, like, let's get onto the interesting stuff. Let's get onto the meat and potatoes, you know, because they'll say things I like, I've, I've literally had more than I should point out to those who don't know. I live in South Georgia. I live in a very small town. I've had more than one person try to defend the existence of Jesus by asking me how the people in the BC years even knew what year it was if it wasn't for Jesus. What were they even counting down to? So, like, you know, you get a question like that, and you're just like, wow, man, I really want to go back on Matt's show and hang out with him for a while. <clears throat> oh, I think it's funny. I, you know, granted, this may be a slight chip on my shoulder. Um, I don't have a degree in anything. I'm entirely self-taught, although I don't take a lot of credit for that because it's easy to be self-taught when there are absolutely brilliant people out there, both creating audio and video content and writing books and, and publishing things. So it's, and you know, in the modern internet based age, it's not that difficult or impressive in my view to, to be self-taught and, and to have a good understanding of things. But the theists, I did a debate yesterday. I'm going to do a debate review of it later. It's, it's a philosophy guy from the UK. Um, but theists, Apologists, I've said recently, the Muslim apologists are that I've interacted with are observably at a lower tier than the Christian apologists I've interacted with. Um, I, that's where I hear some of, not all, but some of the, the dumbest arguments out there. And the thing that's frustrating is that I've spent 18 plus years doing this and taking calls. And in order for me to do it, in order for me to put myself out there live, I have to A, begin by saying I'm not an expert in anything. I'm talking about what I know. I could be wrong. Um, I don't have access to a database. We're not going to be able to do research live on the calls. And yet the theists don't seem to have to have not only any expertise, but any understanding even of their own religion, of their own holy book, of, of its past, of, of, it, of the arguments for it. And uh, don't even know who wrote what or in what language it might have been written uh, or what changed in different versions. Uh, none of this. They just, they know that they know that they know that they know that Jesus Christ is Lord. And somehow or another, while I don't claim any expertise, I've had to become at least passably uh, knowledgeable on a variety of different philosophical dis disciplines like epistemology, um, skepticism, critical thinking. I've had to learn little tidbits of Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and biblical authorship. Uh, and this, this, by the way, is if we just narrowed it to Christianity. And then cosmology and biology and evolution right. and, and the field of abiogenesis. And it's like, why do we, as the people who just don't believe the explanation that this group is offering, have to know 500 times more about 
so many different subjects than the people who are like, nope, it's just silly for you to not believe in God. It's it's obvious. Look at the trees. Yeah. Yeah, no, and like you say, it, it always ends up bleeding into something else, right? Like they'll say, like, I have a question for you about evolution. Oh, okay. And then the question's about abiogenesis. And you're like, that's not evolution. And then the question is about the Big Bang. And you're like, that's not abiogenesis. For Christ's sake, we're not even in biology anymore, man. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you can't if you don't know the difference between biology and chemistry, um, and between chemistry and physics, it, yes, it's it's everything. And when we get out of the the hard sciences, where we're talking about chemical interactions, we're talking about um, like I I breed snakes, and I'm getting ready to do some videos for our um, uh, epic loot exotics on genetics. I'm not a geneticist but I know quite a bit about it. And so I'm going to be teaching a little bit about the difference between um, recessive traits, uh, incomplete dominant traits, dominant traits, co-dominant traits, um, alleles, allele frequency, and whether or not there are, whether, there are some traits that despite being incomplete dominants uh, reside on the same allele. And so they'll produce like things that are called like act like super or uh, allelic combos that, that do extra. But there's a lot to explain and dig into there. I learned about it because I loved it. I, I just, I, I love the genetics. I love breeding these animals and seeing what kind of wild stuff comes out. It's a little bit mad scientist, and yet you're dealing with, you know, cute animals and they're not getting hurt. So it's, it's a nice kind of mad scientist. And so I'll do that uh, just because I love it. But I've had to go research things for debates that I found absolutely banal and boring and i just want to make sure that i when i walk into this debate and somebody presents their their esoteric combination of uh a, a, an argument from contingency using hegelian idealism uh that i'm not just sitting there going you know staring at the screen with my eyes wide because I, I want to be able to contribute mm -hmm. something i wonder if it wouldn't be better and one of the reasons that I like getting different people on the show, like um, I had Aaron on last Wednesday and Aaron was worried that she wouldn't know enough to really dig in on the, on the deep apologetics. And we knew she'd do great. And she did do great because we're not selling anything. You don't have to have any expertise in not being convinced of something. And it turns out that because the apologists know so little, that if you just keep asking them questions and hold their feet to the fire to answer the questions that are asked, you can get to a point of discussion where you can at least identify where you two have parted ways in reality. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'll power to you, man. I don't do debate for precisely that reason. I don't, I don't want to learn enough about all of these different subjects. I got into atheism because I, well, honestly, because I like making jokes about it. It's just religion. It's just a rich source for joke material. I struggle with biology. I find the nomenclature just needlessly confusing. And so I have a lot of trouble with biology. Um, so I tend to pass that kind of stuff off as much as I can. Uh, but like you said, you very rarely need it unless you go and seek it out. Um, yep. So, you know, hats off to people like yourself who, who are willing to put in all of that work so that folks like me can kick back and make dick jokes about it. Yep. It's nice that I actually live in a time where I, I can uh, eke out a living by telling other people what I've learned and trying to help, help them, you know, learn some stuff too. Uh, really appreciate, by the way, we love everybody who's uh, supportive here on the line through super chats and at the Patreon and also at my personal Patreon and all that stuff. Um, that's not what I'm here to advertise right now. So, uh, we got more callers. Grant in Tennessee, pronouns are he, him, an atheist with a question uh, with some advice for us. Welcome to the Sunday show on the line, Grant. Uh, hey, how's it going? Pretty well. All right. Um, so my uh, issue is um, I, I admitted to myself maybe a little over six months ago that I was an atheist. Uh, I've been dealing with it, like going back and forth for about 10 years <clears throat> and uh, about 10 years ago is also when I uh, started drinking a lot because of religion, because I was convinced that it was real. Uh, and if there's, if 
everything's already like predetermined then what's the fucking point you know so like i i uh finally got past that i'm also uh, a year and a half sober and uh Congrats. my question is how do you deal with like i i was told by someone that it sounds like i'm in the angry atheist phase and how do you deal with talking to people when you agree on a social issue but if if i agree with somebody on a social issue and then they bring in religion to it i'm i'm automatically just like i'm out i can't because depending on what we're talking about like for instance the time i'm talking about we were talking about lgbtq stuff and there was this guy who was an older guy probably around my parents age and he uh was talking about how we should just not you know we should just let people be people there's no reason to judge somebody for being born a certain way and i was like all right i'm on to this because my parents are not like that so it's refreshing when i see someone around their age that says that but then the guy was like i've done this i've done this i've studied scripture for 20 years and i just turned the video off because to me that is dishonest if you're trying to tell people uh respect everybody when there's verses clearly in the bible that are contradicting what they're saying so how do you deal with talking to someone and having a conversation and not just like being like oh you're uh, you believe that stuff hmm i mean i don't know that i have mastered that art man <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what i was getting okay. to say um hey, anger is a difficult topic for me because so when i was a kid uh my dad had anger management issues when he was young and basically his dad beat it out of him and so that got passed along to me and i had spikes of angriness as a kid and it essentially got beaten out of me uh, this isn't an abuse thing. i'm opposed to hitting kids or anybody else pretty much uh, ever uh, but and certainly not as a, a punishment or control mechanism but i get accused of being angry a lot and i think that yeah. i have a different take on angry than an anger than a lot of people um you know i am i a hothead yeah sometimes am i angry yeah and sometimes i think if you're not angry you're either not paying attention or you are actively working for a world that is very different than the one that i would like to inhabit and so you're pleased about what's going on I, i'm angry that we lost the supreme court for a generation and that they overturned roe v wade and i don't understand people yeah. who aren't um I understand that some of them generally got their way. What I wouldn't do is when people try to say, oh, you're in your angry atheist phase, maybe you are. Maybe some people go through um, a number of different phases, like the grief phases where you're, you know, you've got denial and anger and all these things. Uh, that could be, it depends on your background. But also it may be that you're just aware and constantly feeling irritated angry frustrated or at least viewed that way from their perspective over things that you should righteously and justifiably be irritated angry and frustrated about uh, it, there's a lot of biblical concepts that i actually will continue to hang on to and one of them is this notion of righteous anger if you're not outraged that the catholic church is a criminal organization that's been shuffling pederast priests around for forever um I, I don't know what the heck could be wrong with you. Now, what often happens with me specifically is that on these shows, we end up having heated discussions. Not everybody's equipped to have these discussions. And some people, and, and I don't tend to take much crap. If I've gone to all the trouble to learn something and have to know, like I was saying before, 20 things, you know, 20 different subjects better than you in order to be able to have this conversation, if I ask a question, answer that question not what you think that question is leading to or some other question related to it because i'm just going to keep pushing back until i get the answer to that question because i'm going somewhere and i think the people who have watched the show and participated and had good calls figured out really quickly oh if i just answer honestly even i don't know whatever it is it's math asking then we move past this little you know ram's butting head moment and we get to go on to have an actual conversation if you're finding yourself if you're looking at yourself and saying 
gosh, I'm just, I'm just too angry. I'm too irritated. There's too much stuff happening here. I can't have, I just cannot take another one of these people saying, you know, heaven needed another fucking angel. Then yeah. you're the best person to assess your psychological state to some degree. And go ahead and take a break. You don't owe anybody a conversation. You don't owe anybody a debate. You don't owe anybody an explanation for who you are. And you're not required to listen to somebody else's blathering about their magical friend who hates gay people. Um, if it's other people trying to say that you're in your angry atheist phase or that your response to something is too over the top, it's possible they could be correct. And it's possible that they're using this as a manipulation tactic to get you to stop talking about it because what you're saying makes them uncomfortable. Every situation is going to okay. be different. I don't necessarily know how to assess the one you're in. What I try to do, one, when I'm on the shows, I try to make sure that people get as good as they give. If they're honestly holding up their part of the conversation, if they're making every effort to have an honest conversation, I don't think you'll see me get upset ever. Um, maybe befuddled at some absurdity that comes out of their mouth, but, but not angry or upset. If they're not engaged in that way, then the things that I try to remember is, number one, I'm on a show. I'm not talking to a family member or a friend at a dinner. I've got a show. I've got a handful of lines open. How disrespectful is it to everybody else to turn this into a 45-minute conversation that's going to go nowhere but yelling? I also have to remember that every episode of every show I ever do may in fact be somebody's first introduction to atheism, to skepticism, to humanism. And I've got to work to be as good of a representative as I can be. I'm going to fail and have failed over the last 18 years over and over and over again. You could put together a highlight clip or let's call it a low light clip of all my worst moments and make me look like a monumental, angry, bitter piece of shit. You could. Um, you could also take all the incredibly long patient times that I've done over the years on the show and make me look completely different. Ultimately, what I try to do is the best I can to be open to, to criticism and not a doormat to criticism. Because there's people out there that are going to be like, oh, you're just angry. You're a bully. You're this, you're that. And if they can't come with any more than like name calling or whatever else, as long as I'm getting... I learned a long time ago, you're not going to make everybody happy doing something like this. And so I kind of look at the feedback I get. And as long as the good is is kind of outweighing the bad, if the positive things of, hey, you helped me understand this, or I'm no longer a theist because of that, if that continues to outweigh the, you're an asshole and God wants me to shut you down, then I think I'm doing okay. And as long as I'm striving to do better, I'm okay with that. And I think as long as you're looking to be the best version of you, um, and acknowledging that you're going to make mistakes and being open to change it, I think you're going to be fine. Okay, cool. Well, and, yeah, uh, well, I really, really appreciate that. Uh, what? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, we're we're on a delay. I'm used to it. So, um, one of the things that you specifically asked that I that I'd like to dig into, and I'd, I'd like to get Matt's thoughts on as well, is working with people who uh, uh, use religious justification for things that you agree with, right? And I have that problem quite a bit. As I, as I said, I live in a small town in, in South Georgia. And the only way that I can do charity work in this town uh, is to work with the church, right? When I, when, I lived in, when I lived up north, when I lived in New York City, I did a lot of charity work because there were a lot of secular groups that you could uh, work with, and specifically atheist groups that you could work with. That's not the case here. Uh, and I find it very difficult to do that work because it's it's constant proselytization, right? That you're constantly being reminded uh, that this is what God wants, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I, after several false starts, I've had to like kind of give up on the idea of doing any kind of organized charitable work where I'm at because I can't get past that. Now, in a normal conversation, if I'm at a, a pride parade, say, and, and somebody's trying to talk to me about being a good ally and they say, well, you know, Jesus says in the Bible and I believe Jesus, Jesus, um, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable saying, hey, you know, I, I disagree with you on religion. I'm an atheist, but obviously we agree on this other source. So um, I'm, not, I'm not super comfortable taking the conversation in that direction. Um, I'm very comfortable saying that. And generally, in my experience, um, 
people who are allied to you for a different cause are, you know, happy to to to, to steer the conversation in a way that you're more comfortable with. Um, but when it comes to what you're specifically talking about, uh, you know, I, I I I I have to admit that I've had to check out entirely of doing important things. You know, that there's not a lot of people doing good charity work in this area, and there's a lot of poverty here. Uh, because I couldn't stand the religious talk. So I, I, I certainly empathize with you. I, I don't know that I can offer you much of a solution, but Matt, I'd be curious if you found yourself in a similar situation, if you have any strategies for that. Um, okay. I don't. Yeah, I've, I've well, go, go ahead, Grant. I, I've never, oh, sorry. Oh, oh I've, I've just never uh, thought of it like that. So thank you. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's good advice. And and I can't answer your question, Noah, because in all honesty, I didn't hear a part of it because of something else that was happening here. So my my apologies for the distraction, but I, I can't answer your question. Uh, but if you if you if you ask it again real quick, I'll at least tell you what I think. Well, have you ever been oh, in a I position saying, where you're doing? Oh, sorry, Grant. I, I, I'm sorry. I thought I was. Uh, no, I was, a, I was asking Noah. Oh yeah, yeah. So oh, it, it, oh, have you ever God. found yourself in a position? Uh, where you're doing charity work or you're working for some social cause that you believe in, um, and the tone of it is so religious in the organization that's, that's that's doing it is so religious that you can't be a part of it or that you're uncomfortable uh, being associated with it. Not by the time I'm actually working with them, um, but there are people I've avoided working with because of that. Uh, and both both with regard to like I have worked with churches, um, I've done debates in churches, I've been paid by churches. Um, I've done charity work, feeding, uh, filling food items uh, right alongside atheists and theists. Because if we're if we're working together and we're not injecting a bunch of religion into it, uh, and all we care about is making sure that people eat, I'm happy to work alongside anybody towards that good goal. But if I find out that, um, like many of the homeless uh, uh, charity efforts that we have here in Austin, because we have a massive homeless population. They will meet under uh, under the overpass at, at uh, I-35 at 6th Street or so and have an entire church service where they essentially hold someone hostage to the gospel in order to get a sandwich. I won't work with them. I'd rather just give the people the sandwich. I'd rather give them the socks and the toothpaste and all of that stuff. Then there's no reason to be to be held to that. So I, I, I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't been in a position where, where I agreed to work with someone and then they turned it into, or it became something that was so objectionable, I had to stop. I just tend to, I try to make sure I look ahead of time. There's actually, and it's happened not just with theist. Uh, I'm doing a convention coming up this summer, um, which I, once I found out one of the charities they were working with, I contacted them to say that I was gonna have to pull myself out of the convention. And fortunately, uh, other people had similar concerns and the organizers, took this to heart, realized what the problem was and fixed it. So now they're not working with that uh, particular charity. Because uh, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, we're, we just wanna do something good and there's no other option other than this church here. And then it turns out that that church is opposed to, you know, death with dignity measures or, you know, hospice care that is, you know, amenable to people of, uh, of more difficult situations. But anyway, that's the super long answer to it. Hasn't happened, but it's, because I intentionally avoided it, so yes. All right, cool. Uh, well, I, I really appreciate both of your uh, both of your times for taking my call. Um, I do, if we have time, if we don't, it's cool. I do have one more question, if and if it's too Go long, it. we, I can just call back. Okay, um, so uh, I kind of had to softly cut off ties with my dad a couple months ago. Uh, because of he wasn't the person that I had, you know, that I was bringing up in the original, but like it was about LGBTQ stuff. And uh, I ended up just having to cut him off. But I'm, I've am i been thinking about not now because I'm still a little too angry to talk to him. Uh, but maybe in the future, um, I was going to try to talk to him and have a civil conversation because we usually just end up yelling at each other. But if if that happens and he doesn't even attempt to try to see it from my point of view, when do you know to that it's a lost cause or do you ever know when it's a lost or is that something that happens? 
good question. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, like, look, it, we, we were talking uh, to the to the dude, uh, Joshua earlier about um, when people refuse to accept definitions and stuff like that. There, there tends to be a spot fairly early in a conversation, in the, especially if the conversation is formulated as, as, as a debate, um, where it's it's clear whether or not somebody is is speaking to you in good faith, whether they're trying to convince you, whether they're trying to convince themselves, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know that I have, um, you know, a heuristic of like, this is where I cut it off. But, um, you know, it sounds to me like you're going into it sort of expecting that. Uh, and and my advice would just be to, to make sure that you really just dip your toes in the water on that, uh, maybe communicate through writing or something like that at, at, at first and, and, and try to gauge his seriousness and willingness to have that conversation before you commit to it at all. Yeah, when it comes to trying okay. to figure out, um, again, you're you're asking all kinds of difficult questions. Uh, damn you! Uh, but, <laughs> but I don't I know that there's any way to come up with um, a, a clear, correct answer on that because it, a good chunk of it depends up on how much you want to put up with. And so I have specific limits that. I mean, it's not like, the, you know, I can say, oh, my limit is this. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's something I can't describe or identify clearly and say, oh, if this happened. I can tell you that, for example, if, um, if my parents were dis anybody, uh, any relative of mine were, were disrespectful, rude, transphobic, repeatedly towards my partner. I don't need them in my life anymore. Um, I don't care that we're related by blood. That's not enough on its own for me to keep someone in my life who's being toxic. And so every time I have an interaction with someone who I have these serious disagreements with or um, where we're just not going to see eye to eye on things, I just have to say, hey, um, do I want to put up with this anymore? Is it worth yeah. me? I, I don't want to make every relationship a sort of cost benefit analysis. That's not quite it, but it is in a little, in, in a way it's a, it, is there anything, what am I getting out of this that makes me want to keep putting up with it? If you walked into your, your, you know, your family member's house and every time they're like, Hey, look, it's the stupid fucking godless heathen here to eat dinner with us again. How long would you keep going back for that? And how much does that kind of clear over the top bizarre example, how different is that from what you're actually dealing with? Uh, you know, if, if you're dealing with everything except for those specific words, if that's the attitude that's being directed at you, if you're not being valued and respected as a person, if your loved ones aren't being valued and respected as a person, I mean, for me, I, I don't need that. Maybe I'm a, a jaded 54 year old who's like, you know what, mom, dad, brothers, sisters, family members get fucked. I got my own life. I'm doing my, maybe, maybe I'm unique or, or, or different in that area. Um, but as much as it would hurt to not have a relationship with some of my family members, I know some of the circumstances under which I would absolutely stop having interactions with them. Uh, and you guys got to make up your mind where you're going to draw the line. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Um, my, my goal now that I don't have religion anymore and I do feel like, or I, you know, as far as I know, this, this is it. So, uh, I'm going to try to, you know, help people that I, I went through the, the whole, like I was homeschooled. Uh, we were Southern Baptist in Mississippi, you know, got in trouble for asking if we were going to church, that kind of stuff. So, uh, and I was in that, like, I, I remember denying, uh, I remember saying, I don't think I believe in science. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I, so I, it's like, I want to help people, but I'm trying to, uh, I don't, I know how easy it is to just deny stuff. Because I mean, if I, if I'm sitting there, someone showed me, uh, what is it called? Quantum levitation. And I was like, oh, that's not, that's not real because 
I just didn't want to admit it. I was sitting there fucking looking at it and I was still denying it. So like, but now I've changed. So because of that, I know that uh, other people can change too. Um, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a cis white guy in the South. I'm kind of at the top of the food chain as far as social stuff goes. So I'm just going to try to use my privilege to help people. Um, yep. So trying to, trying to strengthen my arguments for that stuff. Sounds like a plan. And one of the key things, which I said in the last call as well, is you don't owe anybody an argument or an explanation. And so if the process of trying to explain it or, or, or argue with someone about it is getting in the way of actual understanding or doing good, stop talking and get back to doing good. Okay, cool. Well, man, I, I really ahead. appreciate both of your time. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I just I just wanted to add that, like, you know, sometimes some people aren't cut out for for debate, for argument, for convincing other people. And if, if you find that you're struggling with that or that you're taking time to to do that effectively, a person like you who's who's come out of that, j j just being a part of online atheist communities where you can be sympathetic and, 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 and talk to people who are in a similar situation as you can do every bit as much good as you know, chipping away at theism as well. So, so, you know, uh, if, if, if that seems like something that you can dedicate yourself to, you know, that, that's another thing that's a, a little less, uh, stressful, uh, for a person worried about their mental health or their sobriety or whatever, um, to, to, to cut their teeth on. Um, so just an, another place that you might want to put your efforts. Okay, great. All right. Well, uh, well, like I said, I, I appreciate both of your times. I uh, love what you guys do. And, uh, Thank, thanks for the conversation. Thank you, Grant. Much appreciated. Thanks. Enjoy your Sunday. We've got uh, Ram calling from New Delhi. Ram's a theist pronouncer, he, him, and uh, has a question. So welcome, Ram. How are you? Hi, hi, Matt. Hi. Hi. So, yeah, I have a question. Um, basically, I wanted to ask you your personal story of uh, how you were in a theist before and uh, <clears throat> then something happened uh, and then you said you were an atheist yep and now still you're atheist so that's i wanted to know what's the level of clarity you got so here's the short for is, is there anything ram that you used to believe but you don't believe now yes yes many things sure um, so maybe, maybe this will make sense to you. So belief, I don't think is subject to will or choice. I didn't choose to believe that a God exists and I didn't choose to stop believing. I was convinced that a God existed and it turns out I was convinced for very bad reasons. And when I found out those reasons were bad, the belief just vanished. It's like, I, I, I'm a magician. If I were to show you a mind reading trick and you were to conclude that I was actually psychic and can read your mind, and then I showed you how I did the trick, I think it would be impossible for you to keep thinking that I'm psychic. You would just stop believing that I'm psychic because now you have a better understanding that you were convinced of something for bad reasons. And so for me, that's that's a complete explanation or a nearly complete explanation of how I went from being a theist to being an atheist. I wanted to prove to others that what I believed was right. And in the process, I found out that I didn't have good reasons. And in the 20 years intervening, I haven't found anybody who has good readings, including people who, good reasons, including people who debate it as their job. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not like every, every aspect of science could be presented in court as evidence. And yet God beliefs and supernatural things cannot be accepted in court as evidence. And I mean, what, what yeah. more could you need if we're, if I can walk in and say, Hey, um, I, I shot this person because I happen to be holding a gun and I have a nerve problem with my hand that causes it to twitch. And we were able to show all of those things that might be con 
considered mitigating circumstances. It may not, but at least it would all be accepted that maybe my responsibility for shooting someone um, is, you know, scientifically justifiable and not magic, like is the case with, um, uh, uh, what's his name, who, who ended up getting off. But I couldn't walk in and say, hey, I was holding the gun and an angel pulled the trigger. Uh, what is your view on fate? You don't believe in fate also, right? Believe in what? Fate or destiny. Oh. Or like, yeah. Well, I'm not completely sure. Um, no, okay. what's your thought on on fate or destiny? Well, I think I uh, God is very... Oh, yeah, you can please us. Say. Oh, yeah, I was, get, I was getting no oh. in on this. Ram. Hang on. Yeah, no, no. I, I, um, I believe in determinism. Uh, so I guess that's like fate, uh, except that it's yeah. not consciously directed by a, by a deity. Hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty much in the same position that the universe is, uh, at least softly deterministic or, um, but that doesn't mean it was the, the, the fact, if we rewound the, rewound the universe, which we can't do, it hmm. seems likely that it might play out. In, in roughly the same way, although we don't know what, you know, quantum indeterminacy and little variations, how much it can can amplify and change things. Um, whether it replays out the same way or not almost doesn't matter to me because if it played out exactly the same way, that still wouldn't mean that it was determined by some mind. And I was like some being didn't pick, like the, the, I, there's no reason to think that there was a God who sat back and said, I'm going to create a universe and set it in motion so that on this particular day, at this particular time, Matt and Noah are going to be doing a, a call-in show and get a call from Ram to discuss fate. Um, right. Even if that was absolutely what was going to happen if you restarted the universe, as Noah was saying, there's no reason to think it was consciously guided towards that. So it almost doesn't matter to mm. me. Okay. So what, I'm, I'm curious, what do you believe with regards to faith, man? Well, I am also of the same deterministic opinion. But like, uh, for me, like, I think it does get muddled, uh, the concept of some um, agent directing some force. I don't know. I, I, I am quite confused. Well... That, that can be very frustrating, but quite confused, at least if you're willing to say, hey, I don't necessarily know what the right answer is, and I'm not going to pretend that I do. Maybe about the best position one could be in. Yeah, it is always better for the mental health so to be an atheist than to be an atheist. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is, it is definitely difficult, I think, um, for a lot of the theists that I know to, who have to come up with a reason why things happen when I can just say, well, you know, I can look back at the tragedy um, that is that has occurred in, in my family, say, or in my town or in my country. And and I can say, you know, that that that's a terrible tragedy. And, and what can we do to mitigate that and, 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 and help it not happen? Uh, whereas a lot of the theists that I know have to then figure out why God would allow that to happen. And that causes a lot of theological um, strain in their in their in their uh, mental health, uh, as you're saying. So I, I think there are definitely degrees to which believing that there's a deterministic, like that there's a God determining what's going to happen is, you know, it makes it a little easier. It makes it a little easier to say that it's going to turn around, et cetera. Um, but I think it's yeah far outweighed by the ability, the, the, the inability to, um, to accept sort of the randomness of, of misfortune. Yeah, I understand. Because like uh, from one of the previous conversations that we have had, uh, we were talking about the placebo effect and the nocebo effect. So like Matt pointed out that there are always mostly, most likely what's going to happen in uh, these theistic, uh, you know, whatever rituals or whatever, that people could have a negative effect to that and then they could get freaked out or, you know, take things very negatively and, you know, do things, bad things. So it's uh, very difficult to, uh, and it's very dangerous to, Include the concept of that there is some God 
who must be doing these things so it's not a good idea until you have proof yeah yeah that's kind of where it's at as soon as you realize that hey as much as i might be tempted to believe this um mm -hmm. i i don't i shouldn't run around believing anything until i have sufficient evidence to justify believing it right. and that's I mean, that, that seems roughly where you are and i get it it's a difficult spot to be in to say you know what hey i've had these beliefs all this time and for whatever reason uh gosh m maybe i was right maybe i was wrong but i'm gonna have to at least like stick a pen in it temporarily and say i don't have good reason to believe this right now maybe that will change at some point in the future maybe it won't um uh, yeah it, it sucks that we don't know everything and that we seemingly aren't aren't likely to be able to know everything but uh yeah i, th I think you're at least on the right track of, of being willing to question things and to acknowledge when you may not have a uh, good reason to believe something okay thank you for talking to me and uh, it's great to hear from atheists there are very few here great well thanks so much Ram. Thank you. Well, thanks for the call. It's a wild place to be in. Um, and, and so for the people watching, by the way, I, I know you don't always see what a call screener queues up. We, we always prioritize theistic callers. But what you'll often see in the call description after the uh, call screener, uh, by the way, thank you, call screener, uh, it'll say theist, and then they'll note that well, I'm a theist, but I'm wavering or I'm on the edge or sometimes I'm theistic and sometimes I'm not. And generally speaking, if somebody just says they're a theist and they have a question for us, like, why did you stop believing or did you ever believe? We'll answer those. And then I will push back on them saying, well, now that we've answered your question, you're a theist. Tell us what you believe and why. And in Ram's case, what we got was um, without having to push back much, we got someone who's just honestly saying i have believed this for a while and now i'm realizing maybe i don't have good reasons for believing it and i well i'm not ever going to claim that i'm i'm the one doing it right i think that's a great place to stop answer somebody's question give them something to continue thinking about without going gosh why can't you just give it up i mean you just said you don't have a good reason what 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 so are you, are you okay with bad reasons I've done things like that in the past, um, and I don't know that it works out that well. Yeah, I, th I find it interesting. I very often get that question from theists of what happened to make you an atheist. I was never really a believer to begin with, so it's um, not as dramatic a shift as, as as you had in your life, Matt. But I think they always kind of want, and, and this isn't, I don't think, true in, in Ram's sense, but they kind of want a like a theatrical story, like they want a, a scene in the movie where Matt stopped believing in God, uh, because I think they can they can look at that one moment and then they can say like, oh, if I can undo that moment or create the anti moment or figure out when it was that you started to become angry with God or whatever, then that's going to help them believe that you got there for the wrong reason or that it was this finite thing that if only this one thing had been different then you wouldn't believe and and that answer of like yeah i just honestly looked at the evidence and <laughs> it's kind of silly um that that's the last thing that they want i think i i remember early on i got a lot of things like that um where it was you know who hurt you what happened to mm -hmm. you i'm so sorry for what this church did to you i i used to i granted um i would love to pull up some emails that I got from people over the years. Unfortunately, uh, many years of my emails were fucking stolen by, by an organization uh, that I left instead of letting me uh, archive them off and, and keep them. So fuck you. But I received a number of different emails from people saying, oh, I'm, you know, they'd start off and say, hey, I watched your show the other day on behalf of you know, let me let me apologize for Christians in general for whoever hurt you or whatever happened to you with with that organization or why did you get mad at God? And the people who have heard kind of my my atheist testimony and, and actually paid attention to it stopped doing that because I'm an atheist because I wanted to be a better Christian. Right. I wanted to be able to provide a defense for my beliefs 
because I didn't want to, I was I a believer, I didn't want to get to heaven and have God say, hey, you were supposed to go out there and tell people about me. You were supposed to do this. Why is, why is this guy who you love like a brother and lived with for, for years, why is he burning in hell? I gave you the opportunity to, to witness to him. And so I set out to find a, uh, a way to present Christianity truthfully and honestly to an atheist, uh, and, and in particular, a skeptical atheist. And it turns out if you actually do that, it will backfire spectacularly. I, I, I'll bet money on it most of the time because it's the same thing we have we see happen from kids who are sent to universities, specifically Bible universities. If the Bible university has a uh, has courses on critical examination of the Bible, um, there's a good chunk of people who wind up leaving or abandoning or not being able to maintain their religious faith after that. Textual criticism. Of, of saying, okay, let's let's try to find a way to do kind of exegesis, but uh, in a way that uh, should appeal to anybody, where you don't have to begin with belief and let God try to guide you to some understanding of it. But what does the text actually say? What evidence do we have for it? You know, what good reasons can we have for believing? I had a, I mean, yesterday's debate was with a, a Catholic who uh, openly admitted that he he may be viewed as heretical by some other Catholics, because he was saying, hey, yeah, if there's other non-human uh, species out there, maybe, you know, like, we'll just use Klingon as the placeholder because we went with it there. Jesus could have been, in, in the way the Athanasian Creed talks about Jesus being holy God and holy man, he's also holy Klingon, holy dog, holy whatever, um, or, or sorry, and holy as in fully, not H-O-L-Y, but uh, fully man and all that other stuff. Uh, it is, it is kind of strange to watch people pretend, and it is pretending, I don't care who finds it insulting, that the concept of the Trinity makes sense. It, it just doesn't. I am all God and all man, and also so is this other thing. We are all three the same, and we are different. Um, it violates the foundations of logic, and yesterday this guy tried to use it to say it was in fact the foundation of logic, and that uh, Jesus Christ is the actualization of identity or non-contradiction, that type of thing. He he excludes excluded middle, but I'll do the debate review another time. We got callers. Here's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not even. I'm not even gonna. Uh, I'll just start this. Rob in South Georgia and atheist pronouns are he him uh, has a question for us about atheists in church. So Rob, welcome to the Sunday show on the line. You're live. Hey, thank you for having me. How are you guys today? I'm doing all right. Doing good. Excellent. Hey, guys. Um, so this seems like a really stupid question, but I feel like maybe my, and certainly not everybody, maybe the best thing I could do for society right now is to go back to church and just be like secret agent, because I feel like every <laughs> time anyone leaves the church, it's always the smartest person in the room. And the church, gets, it keeps getting dumber and dumber and more extreme. And maybe if I went back, I could add some intelligence and moderation, maybe. Any thoughts there? Wow, undercover atheists in churches. I like at the, at the exact same moment, both me and Matt went, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> so I don't know, man. I don't think I could do it. Um, yeah, I, I definitely I, see I don't the want idea. to. Uh huh. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I definitely you. see the purpose in it, but uh, yeah, it, 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 yeah, no, Matt, by all means. Well, in some cases, <laughs> you have examples of this uh, in the sense of the clergy project. The clergy project is a group of non believing ministers, preachers, pastors um, who, while they were in the ministry, believed and at some point stopped believing. Many of them are still anonymous, and many of them are still in the pulpit. And so you have these, these circumstances where not only is there a non-believer there, but they're the ones that are picking and preaching the sermon. And what some of them have done, um, I'm, full disclosure, while I have nothing to do officially with the clergy project, clergy project members can reach out and say, uh, you know, hey, they're, they're, I, I'd, li I'd like somebody to talk to. And on a couple of occasions, people have said, I, can you put me in touch with Matt? I'd like to connect with him. So I've, I've offered 
unofficial inexpert counseling and and conversation with some clergy project members and so i ran across some that were like wouldn't it be best for me to stay here and start changing my sermons so that instead of preaching the gospel the way i used to i start preaching goodness the way it should be and i start moving towards a more humanistic approach and where I start to challenge the long head beliefs and, and, and things that, the, that you know, are part of the doctrine of my particular version of religion. And my answer is, I have no idea. I, I genuinely don't. Is your church gonna get together and fire you, vote to fire you? Um, it, I, think it, I think oddly enough, the biggest indicator of whether or not a pastor is likely to be able to stay in their church once they start doing that is by the average hair hue of the people in the audience because the the closer it gets to blue gray the more likely they are to be um very rigid in the religion that they've been in for 50 60 70 years um if it's if it's a different hue of blue then they're likely to be younger and they're dyeing their hair and then you may be able to get away with stuff like that because they'll probably be just as happy in a unitarian universalist church as the average person sitting in the pew, depending on your church, I don't see Southern any room. Baptist. Yeah, I mean, I, I got that part, but I mean, depending on how many people are there, um, I don't see any likelihood that the average person sitting in the pew is going to achieve anything by being the smartest person in the room who also doesn't believe this stuff. I, I don't know what impact you can have on the church. Now, I, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe you get in there, you become a deacon, um, but you're going to find yourself that the, the more, the higher you are in the hierarchy, especially in a Baptist church, the more time you're going to spend praying and working alongside a whole bunch of people who sincerely believe differently from you. And I don't know how much, I don't know how much influence you can have. Well, and along the way, you would actually have to, you know, in the interest, you know, when they put like people undercover in the mob, sometimes they have to do some pretty unsavory shit to, to, you know, maintain their cover. I feel like along the way, you'd have to compromise your, your morals quite a bit. Um, I look at it like, you know, those guys that like, um, they get scam emails and they just play along with the scam to keep the scammer busy. Uh, and they joke around about like, you know, oh, I'm going to send you that money any minute, your highness. Um, I, I, I never recommend people doing that because like, you know, I don't know how good you are at that. And maybe you actually end up getting yourself scammed because you spent so much time with a con artist. I kind of have that same feeling. I had that same feeling when you brought that idea up as appealing as it is to me, just, even to just have like somebody on the inside that can say, no, man, they're saying X, Y, and Z, right? Like I get it, but yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I think I'm with Matt that I think that the negatives would outweigh any positives. I think every every minute that I spent, so like I still go to church on occasion with friends or um, when I want to scout out what's happening in a church because I don't want to straw man anybody. Um, and so I, and it's been a while since I've gone, to be fair. I used to go a lot more often early, in early days working with uh, the atheist experience. Um, I wanted to be able to go in and say, wow, here's the sermon I heard. Here's what they're actually teaching and, and, and portray it honestly. Now I find that my Sunday mornings are better spent doing literally anything else. Like uh, if you said, hey, you can go to church today, listen to a sermon and get really good video content to post about that sermon, or you can play Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, I'd be playing a video game because I already have enough content ideas to run me four videos a month for the next four years. So uh, I'd rather use my downtime wisely. So I, I don't know, Rob, what I, what I would say is you can go and you can take notes and you can probably talk to some other people about what strategically you, you think you can do. Uh, and you may find a, a way to be really useful that way. I'd love to, I, and I know everybody, watching would love to hear uh hey here's how you can go not to be a i don't want people going in and disrupting people's church services that's not what this is about um but uh, to subvert that that may be that may be worth it 
Uh, I think that's good advice. The last time I actually was in church, I um, ended up standing up and walking out in the middle of the service. I just, I couldn't take it anymore. So maybe I couldn't do it anyway. Thanks for your wisdom. I appreciate it, guys. <laughs> that that sounds like you sent a pretty strong message that day. Yeah, right, right. Maybe that's it. You just walk into different churches and then walk out dramatically at the first homophobic moment or something. I don't know. I mean, you know, look, you're talking to a guy yeah. who's watched a Christian movie once a week for the last, God, seven years now. So, like, I get that. I get the instinct of wanting to know what's out there. But, um, yeah, it's certainly yeah. not for everybody. Right. Um, well, thanks for your time, guys. And uh, maybe I'll give it a shot. And if if I do, I'll let you know how it went. Cool. Thanks, Rob. Have All right. A, have a great day. You too. You too, man. Enjoy this surprisingly cold uh, South Georgia weather. South South Georgia is cold right now. I, I mean, it's cold for South Georgia in May. It's like uh, mid sixties the last couple of days. So. Wow. I uh, yeah. I don't get to Georgia as as often. Well, no, I get to Georgia exactly as often as I'd like. No, that's not quite true uh, because I would go to Dragon Con every year, except that I I can't. It's it's just yeah. hasn't worked out. Um, we're hoping to maybe it's probably too late for me to get involved with the skep track, uh, this year. And I have so many other things going on that I, I can't even commit to saying, yes, I will apply. Uh, again, I've, I've done dragon con once and I'd, I'd love to go back every year and be part of the skep track. Um, but yeah, it's, that's in, I, I think in all the years we, we've talked a little bit about potentially trying to find ways to subvert churches and, and the one thing i've kept pointing out is that uh nobody should be going in and, and disrupting a church i, I don't mind if you stand mm -hmm. up and walk out because you got fed up i mean that's honest but if you walk into a church and you're sitting there and all of a sudden you start you know yelling at the pastor from the pew about how this is all lies it's all lies this is fairy tales and lies fairy tales and lies to take your money and control you it doesn't matter how right you are you lost um because yeah. those people were yeah. not in any sort of position to consider that, um, honestly. But yeah, no, that's why I don't do it. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I can make it through a service without at least standing up once, going like, "Debate me, bro." So. I, I, yeah, and that's coming from somebody. See, if you if you did more debates, you'd be like, "This guy's not ready for debate." It, it would be yeah. pointless for me to stand up and say, <laughs> "Debate this guy." It's funny because, you know, I, I don't, um, yeah, let's just go ahead and mute Jacob because I'm tired of the excuses. Either you're going to call in or you're not. I don't need you talking about it in chat. Um, so it's this notion of who knows the most. I remember when I first started to realize the complete cluelessness that one could possess and still be considered a respected, prominent man of God. And by the way, it's almost oh, always Oh, I think you're gonna say Supreme Court Justice. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. That, that's, that, that one I'm starting to learn a little bit more as well. Um, but it's the, I when I was at First Baptist Church of Harvester in like 1984, 85 uh, or so, we were, the church was starting to expand and wanted to bring in a new preacher. And we brought in this, uh, I, to me, I thought he was like 19, uh, incredibly young guy uh, from Kentucky, uh, young, good looking, charismatic, healthy basketball player guy. Um, and he showed up and it was, you know, the only thing that mattered was the sermon. And so it didn't hit me at the time, but what you're really picking is the person who resonates with you because if you begin with this notion that god is designating who should be the the preacher there then the person who resonates with you if you're right with god is going to be the one that god wants you to pick and i remember you know we would, we would travel around to different churches when we would move um and we ended up at whatever church my mom liked the preacher better because if that's if he was preaching god's word the way she understood it then she liked him and that was it but the guy was just like out of high school day. I don't, I don't think didn't have a degree in anything. And then I was like, hang on, is a degree even required? Uh, there's, there's no requirement. I, I could go be a 
I could have been a Baptist preacher without going to college, without going to seminary. There's no seminary requirement. It's helpful um, yeah, to, to win over some portion of the congregation. But that's when I realized, oh, in my head at the time when I was still a believer, it was, if I, I believe God was real, so God's going to pick out the preacher that we're supposed to have, and it's just going to be obvious. And what could be more obvious than, wow, that was an amazing sermon. I could listen to you every week. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's all the qualifications you need. And in Tennessee yep. and, and in Kentucky, you, you possibly need a qualification that you're willing to handle rattlesnakes and copperheads. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, in so many ways, the whole concept of the Holy Ghost is just a man uh, or just a means of elevating your own personal inner monologue to divinity, right? Yep. It is. Uh, it's amazing how much God agrees with me and always has. Isn't it, though? Yeah. So I'll apologize potentially uh, in advance. We'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, but. As has become somewhat tradition, we have a manual calling in from Texas wanting to continue the conversation um, about how Christianity helped him survive trauma. So, a manual, you're alive on the line. How are you, Matt? Uh, last time we talked about how I felt when, when I left, uh, you know, uh, Mennonite denomination. Uh, yeah. Then I joined uh, Pentecostalism. So. Uh, so my point was, you know, when you like, I think the message uh, of the New Testament is very good, uh, you know, to survive depression, uh, anxiety, or a certain religious promise. So I don't know why you wouldn't agree when it's like really obvious that it is helpful, um, you know. So you, you don't know. And we were talking about how you could get your sins forgiven. You never gave me a direct answer uh yeah how you, you don't know your you're saying you don't understand why i would favor actual science about depression over a book that uh, uh has been used to diagnose depression as demon possession you don't know why i'd prefer the science uh, but still uh, i i mean i agree with you that uh, devils uh, could uh, you know, manifest in depression. I, I absolutely. No, no, no. I didn't say it's that. Not... No, no. <laughs> it's literally the opposite of what I said. I don't. Okay. I don't believe there I mean, are I devils. I think you just made I a don't... great argument against your point, man. So let me try it this way, Emmanuel. If you run across someone who's depressed, are they better off seeking a qualified scientific? counselor or a preacher uh and if, if the preacher have a psychology degree that will be a different thing i know preachers who have psychology degrees so but okay. it, it is better to get a qualification help i find it i find it interesting no different? stop stop listen i appreciate the fact that you're not standing outside in traffic like you were last week but listen um i set up a scenario where is it better for someone to get treatment from someone with an actual medical understanding or from a preacher? And you had to say, well, if that preacher has actual medical understanding. Okay, so let's take two people. One of them has the actual medical understanding and one of them has the actual medical understanding and is also a preacher. Which one of those is better for someone with depression? It will be the same. It'll be the same. So you don't think that that person's religious belief has any impact at all on the sort of treatment that they're going to give it doesn't impact it, it, it then it's irrelevant way. then it's irrelevant whether or not is there a preacher right so the, what matters is yeah, what i initially said which is someone with a medical degree so the preacher part is completely irrelevant and yet you're sitting here calling in to talk about how you think the new testament is good for dealing with depression and you don't understand why i won't accept that when just a couple of quick questions, you now agree with me. Congratulations. Yeah, uh, yes, Matt, but uh, 
how about there are depressions that are related to, uh, you know, committing mm-hmm. sins. So you you don't get washed out uh, of your sins just because. So that's I don't, why be- I don't believe, Emmanuel, I, I don't believe that sin is a real concept. Have, have you ever looked at a woman with lust, for example? Many, 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 that. many, many times. I don't think so, it's a sin. So you have committed I, adultery, right? No, no, I haven't. But, I haven't committed adultery, and I don't think that adultery is a sin. I don't think anything is a sin. I think there are things that are immoral, but I don't think that anything is a sin. Sin is something where you are working, you, where you have taken an action that is contrary to the mind of God. I don't think there's a God, therefore, I don't think there's sin. However. Are you saying okay. let's 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 hang on, hang on hang on hang on hang on stop stop listen let's just stick with the one example are you saying that okay. it is immoral to look at another human being with lust yeah, absolutely because the, Why? the first uh, because one of the ten commandments is I don't care what the ten commandments are I don't care what the ten commandments are the Ten Commandments say okay. that the Ten Commandments say would say that it's immoral to have any god other than uh, Jehovah. The Ten Commandments say you must yeah, honor your father and mother, even if they're absolutely awful. The Ten Commandments are so, stupid. I, so, oh, what's okay, the reason? Re- what's religion. what's the reason? What's the reason that it's immoral to look at someone with lust? Okay, let's say you have a daughter, right? She is like twenty one or. I'm sorry, Emmanuel, your phone's breaking up. Your phone is breaking up. Start again with, let's say you have a daughter. Let's say you have a daughter. She is 21 or 22 or whatever, right? She's walking down the street and someone looks at her with lust or with a perverted look. How would you feel towards that guy? It doesn't matter how I would feel. feel Go ahead now. Oh, yeah. Say, why would I feel any way about it? What 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 is what does it matter to me what's happening in that guy's head? I I don't know that most people think that's bad. Okay. Why are are you saying that people shouldn't be attracted to my daughter? What's what's the matter with my twenty one year old daughter? Like my, my my point is, uh, out of sin comes guilt. Out of sin comes uh, anxiety. We're not talking about we're not fear. talking about sin. Oh, Amen. No. Okay, hang on. I'm going to mute you. So I want you to listen. I want to be very clear. We're not talking about sin. I don't accept that sin is a concept. So don't go talking about sin right now. I asked whether or not it was immoral to look at another person with lust. Lust being sexual desire. I would, if I look at someone and say, oh, they're really freaking hot. I'd love to have sex with them. What is immoral about that? That's the question. Because it's perverted, right? It's, no, I'm uh, sorry, it's, Emmanuel. It's, I, 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 perverted is a word that you're using to assert once again that it's somehow immoral or wrong. Um, I, I don't I don't care whether or not you think it's perverted. I care whether or not you think it's immoral. What is immoral about it? Who has been harmed by looking at someone with lust? The person who's who's lusting is being harmed at the moment, right? How because are they being they harmed? If, if, if I'm if, if I'm looking at a young woman and lusting, how am I being harmed? Because after that, you'll feel guilt because you no, have I don't. Better with no, love. I don't. I don't feel guilt. I do not feel guilt because I haven't bought into the bullshit notion of sin. Yeah, man, you're actually yeah, presenting I mean, an argument about how the New Testament is great at creating depression. You're saying that yeah. uh, sinning creates guilt and anxiety. Well, it doesn't for Matt. It doesn't for me because we don't believe in sin. So it seems to me that believing in sin is terrible for your mental health. Yeah, uh, 
I understand what you're saying, but there's a solution to it because there's a, I think there's a, I think, you know, Christ's sacrifice is like good to our, because I, I stopped feeling guilt after I understand what has been paid. Okay. I'm muting you again, Emmanuel. Listen very carefully. Every time we start to talk about something, we tell you what we, what we think and you try to tie it back and ignore it. So now we said, why is it immoral to look at someone with lust? And your answer was, because then you'll feel guilt. Well, first of all, if you've done something wrong, you should feel guilty. Um, but your assertion that someone would feel guilty is rejected. I won't feel guilty because I am not convinced that I've done anything wrong. A, you still need to stay on this point here of saying, how do you show that I've done something wrong? Don't go to, I think you can fix it because Jesus took my guilt away. I don't care if believing in the tooth fairy takes your guilt away. I care why your guilt is there in the first place. And if you haven't done anything wrong and you feel guilty, then it's you that's broken in feeling guilty. It is the guilt that is the problem, not what you've done. So I'd like you to explain how it is immoral for one person to look at another one with sexual desire. Uh, the emotional damage that happens to me, like, I feel, you know, kind of like, what is wrong with me, right? Why am I... So Emmanuel, annoyed? stop. Listen. Mm -hmm. The fact that you feel emotional damage, really sorry, but you are not the world. And if you felt emotionally difficult about eating peanut butter, that wouldn't mean that eating peanut butter is immoral. So don't tell me why you are bothered by lust. Tell me why lust is a sin for anyone. Uh, okay, so the the byproduct of I think you know committing lust is like people steal, people you know they 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 force other people to have relation with them because of that lust. They, no, they don't. committed a, they committed a lot of a trip. No, like, Emmanuel. Okay, how? No. Emmanuel, no. We're talking about lust. You don't get to say, oh, they force people to have relations with them. No, that's rape. And it is immoral mm -hmm. because the person being harmed is the person who's being raped. It violates individual autonomy and consent. Do you think it is, is it possible to look at someone with sexual desire and not physically assault them? Is that possible? It is possible, but people cool. Make then you don't get to bring up. To then the you don't get. Then you don't get to bring up the. Then you don't get to bring up the physical assault as a reason why the lust is wrong. I'm going to give you another chance to explain why it's immoral to look at someone with lust. And if you don't do better, I'm going to move on to another caller. I, I mean, that's all that I have, Matt. It, it separates thanks. us from God. I, I don't I, I love I would love to be separated from God. I don't believe there is a God. You are keep you keep calling in because you have a belief, and this belief has poisoned your mind and turned you into a blubbering buffoon because you are feeling guilty about things that are perfectly normal because you followed a slippery slope argument about how lust leads to rape or lust leads to guilt. It's not lust that caused the guilt. It is the bullshit religious virus that infected your mind that convinced you that you've done something wrong by existing and engaging in perfectly normal human behavior. If there was no lust, there would not be a species. It's lust that drives us. It's not the soul thing that drives relationships, but lust is there to drive us to propagate. It is an absolutely normal thing. It's not lust that is the problem. It is sexual assault that is the problem. It is the way religions get into someone's mind and convince them that they are broken and immoral and need to kowtow and donate part of their income and go out and tell other people how they are broken and kowtow and need to give part of their income. It is a mind virus that has polluted the world and you are infected. Uh, hello? Yeah. Hello, uh, Matt. One, one, one time, uh, I was like teaching this guy 
and he told me that he couldn't be a Christian because he had a same-sex attraction. So what, I, what I'm telling you is people are giving an excuse not to come to the truth and the light. Goodbye. That, don't the, ever, don't ever call my shows again. I'm done with you, Emmanuel. I have played this game with you. I just gave a dissertation on what's absolutely wrong, and you disregarded all of it to say that somebody said they couldn't be a Christian because they had same-sex attraction. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck what you think. I don't think that you're actually teaching anybody anything, and I don't think you're teachable. Go find somebody else to correct your confusion. I'm done with it. Sorry, Noah, but Emmanuel has called about a million Ooh. times with levels of stupid that really today was a, a moderate mess oh it wasn't really i i've never understood this, this this i call it the ray comfort gambit i'm sure he didn't create it but 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 i i this this whole like you know have you ever looked at a woman with lust and and this is supposed to convince us that we're bad people well like obviously when he asked he knew we were both going to either say yes or lie right yeah um well i don't know if he knew my sexual orientation so i guess i could have but but regardless like that's the reason that's the purpose of the question well all that proves is that your standard of ethics is bad you have a bad if, if everyone gets caught in your net then it's a bad net right like yeah. like if it, 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 you're just proving that biblical morality is useless i i've, I've yep. never understood that argument it's really frustrating because i don't believe that sin is an actual thing i think that sin is the label that Christians in general use to talk about, hey, you're not living life in accordance with what God wants. And I already know that. Uh, I, I, I was a believer for decades, and I know what you think God wants. I don't know what God actually wants, though, because if God exists, he's too cowardly to come talk to any of us and explain um, what he wants or what he thinks about anything. He's playing, he's the world champion of hide and seek. Um, and yet the number of people who are convinced that they've not only found him, but know exactly what he thinks about stuff is staggering despite the fact that they all disagree and have formed thousand over a thousand denominations but we have a couple other theists who i'm hoping um will do uh better than a manual so jacob in chicago pronouns are he him you are on the sunday show on the line welcome yo yo thank you um do you want me it, to it says, say my question it says here, or do you want to yeah it's, it says here the question you want to ask is why do you want to know what i believe if you don't believe in anything yes that's what I thought of, but I, I believe um, I believe in many things. I don't know I don't know where you got this idea that I don't believe I don't in anything. That, I believe yeah. I believe in many things. I do believe that. <laughs> I do. Okay. So I want to know what you believe. He believe in me or you? I believe or? in you. I believe in you. That's like what I believe in. No, no, no. I'm saying you th you said that I don't believe in anything, but I'm telling you that I believe in many things. I, I know. Okay, then why so did you say you, I don't believe in anything? Because you don't believe in me. I believe in you. I'm talking to you. If you don't believe in me, or if you do believe in me, then you then you can said, believe in what I'm saying. I just said I believe in you. No, if I believe that you exist and I'm talking to you, that doesn't mean that I believe what you say is true. You don't have to believe what I say is true, but you should at least believe that I'm real. I, I do. I already I said so. I came from parents. We all came from I, I, parents, I, I, and uh, I, I already, I already said so. Are, I, is, are you not able to hear me? I am able to hear you. Absolutely. Okay. And the, um, the answer to your question of why do I want to know what you believe is because I want to know what people believe and why, because what they believe dictates what actions they're going to take. It tells you how they're going to vote, how they're going to treat people, what they think about other people, and your beliefs. And your actions have consequences for the rest of us. That's why I want to know. That's why I want to know what you believe. That's why I wanted to listen to you. Well, you didn't just listen, though. You can call in. And when you call in, if you want to know what I believe, you shouldn't say that I believe nothing. Well, I didn't say nothing. I said anything. You said, I, okay, Jacob. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt one last time. It says here that you said I that that I don't believe in anything, and when I said, I, when I phrased that as you you said I believe nothing, um, are you saying that that's not what that means? It means that you don't believe in anything, and yet I'm telling you I believe in many things. 
So what is the source of those things? Where do they come from? You're telling me that they don't come from anywhere. You didn't because even ask they come from those... people. Uh, okay, Jacob, are, are you, if you're just a troll, I, I uh, have other yeah, I'm caller... a troll, okay. <laughs> okay, then goodbye, jackass, because I got other callers waiting. You didn't ask what I believed, and yet you want to know where it comes from. You're so full of shit. Stop wasting my guest time. It's rude. I feel like Sir? maybe there was like two pages stuck together in his, um, you know, how to defeat atheists in an argument book or something there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how it's so strange. where he got. Let me call in and tell them they don't believe anything. And then when they say they do, let me tell them that they don't and then that they do and that they don't believe in me. I mean, is it most confused? Let's try again, because we have another theistic caller, and I want to be as optimistic as possible. Sergio and Texas pronouns are him, wants to tell us uh, about the Bible and what a Christian is. So welcome to the Sunday show on the line. You're on with Noah and Matt. Uh, hello, Matt and Noah. Um, yes, Sergio. Welcome. Hello. No, I, I commented on the chat, and they said to call in. Okay. And... Um, I mentioned uh, one thing. I think uh, what the Bible, that the Bible um, tells us, or one can read it and then determine what a Christian is. Uh, the reason I say that is because a lot of times uh, I hear, maybe not so much atheists, but just people say something about Christianity, and it doesn't line up with what the scriptures, the Bible says, and therefore I come to say that, hey, that's not lining up. That that's not uh, what Christianity teaches. All right, okay. so I so, would say, and go ahead, no. oh, sorry, go ahead. And no, I, no, no, you're so fine. I don't know if you say, want me to answer. Um, sorry, I don't hang know. On, Noah, Noah's asking what a question. I, what I believe in, why? Oh. Noah's asking a question, which might get to that. Yeah, so it, it, it's it's actually gonna gonna butt right up against that because I've read the Bible, um, mo multiple translations of the Bible, multiple times, and I think that it would be very, very difficult, given nothing but the Bible, to come up with any of the modern interpretations of Christianity based solely on that book, right? So I'm curious, when you say, like, what, that's not what the Gospels say, this isn't what the gospel will, or what the Scriptures say, rather, sorry, not, not, not just the Gospels. Um, well, the Scriptures say a lot of stuff that would be, you know, illegal if you put it into practice. Um, so what, what specifically do you think that the Scriptures say? Uh, and, and, and and what therefore makes a Christian. Okay. Well, one thing that just pops into mind, um, I think I heard earlier someone talk about uh, maybe how they were abused by their family because of their Christian uh, upraising. Is, is that right? Well, when I hear stuff like that, I look to the scriptures and about how parents should treat their children and how uh, whether it's to raise them in the ways of the Lord or to how to love or them. Hit them with a rod. Uh, when I hear uh, people say that they left because their family invited them over for Thanksgiving and they're calling them names or making fun of them, that that doesn't align with what a Christian should do. Uh, Jesus said to love your enemies, and and you know. Uh, if you're to love your enemies, how much more and equally should you love a child that doesn't believe? Treat, treating them with respect and honor and, and love and just, um, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, but but um, I can pick so that, out that's, that's, portions of the Bible that are very contradictory to that as well. Those are also in the scriptures, right? Um, so what, who? Uh, how, how does I've one heard... determine which part of the scriptures were basic okay i mean i understand I've, i'm trying to learn more of the contradictions that people point out uh but like one example would be like um I, i've heard a, a woman who divorced the husband based off a scripture that said uh put on the new man and if you read the text and, and you get the context well then you you see that Hey, that that is not that's contradictory to what Christ is teaching. The Bible teaches. Um, an, another example could be like uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, you can't. Um, in, so here's the thing in, in, the, I, in the scripture. Hang, okay. hang on. So 
sure. you're saying the Bible tells us essentially what a true Christian is. And so let's go through simple verses that tell us what a true Christian is. Because my, after years and years of doing this and having identified and, and been a Christian, um, I don't think there's a single testable, identifiable criteria that the Bible offers. Because, for example, in Acts 11.26, it, it describes Christians as followers of Christ. But it doesn't tell you what that means or how to tell whether or not somebody is or isn't a follower of Christ. There's no way for me to tell whether or not somebody is or isn't a true follower of Christ. Similarly, in, in Corinthians, um, it's, it talks about the resurrection being of first importance and that people have to have faith in the resurrected Christ. But I have no way of telling if somebody actually has faith in the resurrected Christ. Um, in, in Romans, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That to me is what I used to identify as an actual Christian, the Romans 10, 9, and 10. And the problem is, is that you have no way of telling what somebody does or doesn't believe in their heart, and it's really easy for someone to profess with their mouth. Here, watch. Jesus Christ is Lord. I just did it. That doesn't mean I'm a true Christian. And so what testable criteria can you present from the Bible mm -hmm. that would identify who is or isn't a true Christian? Okay. Well, uh, I just from the scriptures you pointed out, um, like uh, Acts 11, I think you said 26. It was, um, that was one of them, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I think that... I, I was expecting you to give me different verses because none of those verses have testable criteria. So I was wondering if you had a different verse that had testable criteria, because I haven't found any. Oh, yes. Well, I, w I would point to just one scripture. I would see it as a whole document, like the whole scripture. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Sergio, but that's a cop-out. You can't just say, oh, I got to okay. look at it as the whole document. Well, if you're going to say the Bible will allow you to identify who is a true Christian and who's not, then you need to say, Here's the verse that describes the testable criteria that you can use to determine who's a true Christian. Because I also would hold that the Bible says you can't know that only God knows who is or isn't. Only God knows whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so if you're running around pretending that you can tell who is a true Christian and who isn't, then you are, from my point of view, as a former Southern Baptist, a heretic. You are claiming that you can do something that the Bible says only God can do. So you can't give me this, oh, you got to look at the whole book. I know the whole book. I know it really fucking well. I want to know what scripture gives a testable method to identify who is or isn't a true Christian. Okay. Acts eleven twenty six, And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Yes. Um, okay. The disciples. Um, uh, would you say that you're a disciple of Christ? No, are I you? I don't run around like I, I don't run around looking like saying, "Oh, that's Christian." That's I, I first listen to what they say. So that's why I'm asking: are, are you a disciple of Christ? No, are you? Do you follow his teachings? Are, so are you a disciple you of Christ? According to that, I, I'm not claiming to be a Christian. Are you a Christian? Right. But the point that Matt no, makes, Sergio, is that anyone can say that, right? Like, I can't tell if, if, okay. if, if, if Matt had answered yes, would you have had to accept him as a Christian and therefore, like, accept what he says on, on behalf of Christianity as indicative of what Christians believe? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, yes, you would. That's what I'm saying. Excuse me? Yes, you would accept it, that 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 he spoke on behalf of Christians if he had answered yes to your questions? Because again, like I can't, there, as Matt's saying, there's, it's not like I can put a, like a litmus paper against you and find out if you've accepted Jesus as, as your personal Lord and Savior or whether you're a disciple of Christ or whatever. There's no test for that. So I, I would just have to take somebody's word on it, correct? Well, no, no, that's not what the, the Bible teaches. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, 11, Acts 11, 26. If, if you say that you're not a disciple of Christ, then you're not a Christian. Yes, you can say, 
that other verse that I pointed out, uh, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, yes, uh, that is up to the person. But also, it's it's not um, when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, don't you think the litmus test is the people's action? So that's why I go back to how uh, if a non-Christian goes back home for Thanksgiving, and the family makes fun of them or treats them wrong because they're not a Christian, then that would, uh, even though you're confessing that Jesus is Lord, either you need to be corrected through the scriptures that you align with, with uh, what Jesus Sergio. taught about Christianity, or you'd be a hypocrite. And Jesus Sergio. said that the, both hypocrites Sergio. and believers would be in the same. Yes. Sergio, give me a verse that includes a testable method for determining that someone is a true Christian. Nobody is saying that you can't tell that there are some people who aren't. I will tell you to your face, I am not a Christian. You don't have to look that up in a Bible or anywhere else. Just the second I told you I am not a Christian, you know I'm not a Christian. That's not what the question is. The question is, how can you verify that someone is in fact a true Christian? Can you know what's in their heart? No. Can you know whether they're in the Lamb's Book of Life? No. Is it possible for them to profess no. Jesus with their mouth and not actually believe, believe it or be saved? Yes. Is there any testable criteria presented in the Bible that will let you verify that someone is a true Christian? I know this is the hardest no in your history, but the right answer is no. No, I wouldn't say that. I, I know you say, wouldn't, uh, but you're deeper, wrong. Deeper I know you wouldn't say that, but you're wrong. And the reason you won't say it is because you won't be honest. If there is a verse that has a testable criteria, what is it? Okay. Um, I'd have to search for it. Go search for it. Uh, call us back I, whenever you I, want. I We're happy to take another call where scripture. you can where you can actually present um, what the Bible says to verify, testably verify that someone's a true Christian. Okay. Um, cool. Thanks, Sergio. Think on that up, I would also recommend that you uh, Google the "No True Scotsman" fallacy. Excuse me. Uh, I said while you're looking that up, I would also suggest you Google the "No True Scotsman" fallacy. Um, because what you're basically saying is Christians are good, and you can tell because people who are who say they're Christian and aren't good aren't really Christian, which is self-referential and therefore like meaningless from a logical perspective. Okay, so what what do you think of like um, like just something basic, like not basic, but uh, God's command to Thou shalt not kill. Well, I don't think well, God commanded all, it. I'm not aware that God commanded anything, but um, thou shalt not kill. We have to kill to eat, uh, whether we're killing plants or animals. Um, but the prohibition against murder um, doesn't require any sort of God um, to know or understand. But would, would you agree that if, if you were professing to be a Christian and you kill people, would you agree that hey, that's not definitely not a Christian? No, I mean you use well, not at all no, because there are you... parts of the Bible that tell you should kill, right? Like what about the part that you know says that you should suffer no witch to live and all of that stuff? No, that, that there have been Christians throughout history that have killed in the name of of Christianity. So yeah. I, I would say that, that killing is historically an intrinsic part of Christianity. And by the way, if a Christian kills someone, can't God forgive them? The Bible does, uh, through Jesus' death and resurrection, he provides a way to be forgiven. Yes. You, you know what's really mm -hmm. you know what's really annoying, Sergio? I loved it when I was asking questions and you were just, that were yes or no questions, and you just say yes or no. And now, every time we get to something that is that is a sticking point, that exposes some flaw in your thinking, instead of just saying yes or no, you give a sideways answer. 
Um, yes, the Bible provides through Jesus' resurrection and salvation. That he, no, no, no. The, the question was really simple. Is it possible for a Christian to murder someone and still be forgiven by God? And the answer is yes, because also it's possible for God to tell Christians to kill people, isn't it? He wouldn't tell Christians to kill people, no. Did he, did he tell he Moses to go out and slaughter the Midianites? Uh, where maybe, I, maybe not Moses. But did, did, did God not all order the slaughter of the Amalekites? In the old, yes, I believe uh, he did command the Israelites. So, so God can command people to kill people, right? He wouldn't do that like today. He wouldn't do it. So are you saying that the Old Testament is lying when it says God did do that? Did God tell Abraham to no. kill his only son? He went, he told him, uh, I believe, to sacrifice his only son. Did God tell Abraham to <laughs> kill his only son? Yes, he would have killed him, yes. And he stopped yes. him. And, and and so under if the Bible says that God told Abraham to kill his only son or to, to kill Isaac and God told um, the various leaders to run around killing the Amalekites and, the, and everybody else why on earth are you justified why should anybody believe you when you say God wouldn't tell anybody to kill someone you, you don't know your Bible or you're not portraying it honestly in, in the book well, in the I, Bible in the Bible does God command people to kill other people? Yes. So what justification do you have for saying that God would not command people to kill other people? I would I would say it's the um the understanding of uh, the discussion of the Old Testament versus the new new covenant and the new testament. Yeah, th that sentence doesn't even make any sense. I'm going to let you go. You go and think Sergio, well, you it, come up with No, we're done. We're done, Sergio. We're done. You have question. failed Sergio, you have failed epically. What, here's what you need to do. Do you believe that God answers prayer? Yes. Do you, does, does, if, if you ask God what you should say the next time you call into this show, call back when he gives you an answer. Okay. Uh, one question. Nope. No question. You called in to tell us that the Bible tells you what a true Christian is, and you got disproven repeatedly. The Bible is very clear that nobody knows who a true Christian is. Only God knows whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But you don't know the Bible well enough. And then you want to assert that Which, God would never command somebody to kill someone, despite the fact that that's exactly what he does repeatedly in the Bible. Uh, you don't get any questions. you got to go off and do your homework. Go ahead. It's such an epic failure, too. I mean, like what he's what he's obviously what he's trying to say is that, like, you know, it's, it, they're not Christian if they're not nice to you or whatever is as though that was um, some acceptable or accepted um, metric of Christianity. Um, but when we're, when we're asking him for a metric that we can actually use where he went was, well, if you killed somebody, you wouldn't be Christian. Right. Which we disproved using using the Bible, using yep. his own uh, source. But like. Think about even if we granted that to what a shit metric that is. Okay, so like if I know someone murdered another person, now I can discount what they say about Christianity. That's a that's a pretty big ask for a very small gain. And and yeah. he failed to make it. So that that's pretty epic. It's it's pretty pretty straightforward. Name one action that only a true Christian could take. Sure. That, that's step step one. Name any action that only a true Christian could take, and it needs to be a verifiable action. Because if you say, "Oh, well, the only only a true Christian could sincerely believe in their heart that Jesus was resurrected," none of us have access to. First of all, beliefs don't fucking reside in your heart, um, but none of us has access to some, whether or not somebody sincerely believes in their heart or their mind or whatever else. So, name some action that only a true believer could take. I, I'm not aware of any such action. Right. And the right. Bible doesn't list well, and Sergio wants us to, Yeah, and Sergio just wants us to take Sergio's word on who is and isn't a Christian, right? Not the Bibles, right? Like you said, that that's not in the Bible anywhere. Um, but Sergio has decided that it is, and so he's set himself up as the arbiter of who is and isn't a real Christian uh, with this faux biblical explanation and not even realized that it's a, it's a sort of self-authored thing. 
Yeah. My apologies. I got a message in here that we're uh, on Monday, by the way. So here, let me let me take a moment to, first of all, uh, thank Dragon for uh, screening our calls today and thank all, all of our moderators who are doing a wonderful job in chat. I know there's been some people uh, uh, advocating for chat things, but I, I, I want to say that uh, we've got a couple more callers uh, and if we don't get more theists outside of those, then I'll just go ahead and uh, end the show then and, and turn people loose because I don't want to keep Noah for 15 hours. I do want to keep Noah for 15 hours actually, but uh, he and I both have some Zelda to play um, mm -hmm. and, and other things that we need to, to get done. So let me tell you once again, what's coming up this week on the shows here on the line. And just during that last call, because uh, I'm really good at multitasking, even though I sometimes fail, I, I secured a challenge. So here we go. Monday, Skep Talk uh, at 6 p.m. Central with me and Paula Gia. I will be addressing that right after the rest of these. Tuesday, Dying Out Loud with Dave Warnock and Aaron Lewis. Uh, if you're not familiar, go back and watch the last couple of episodes, but please tune in and uh, give Dave some love because um, he's dying. And he has really interesting thoughts about what it's like to be in that position where you are faced with a terminal illness and having to reevaluate portions of your life and figure out and prioritize what means the most to you. I, 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 when Dave dies, I will sincerely miss my friend as much or more than I've missed uh, Dargendorp and other friends that I've lost over the last couple of years. Uh, but mostly I'll, I'll miss the things that I've learned in having conversations with him and in thinking about his situation and what he says. Um, on Wednesday, I will have uh, Stacy from Apostasy or the Stacy's Mom podcast thing. I think it's what it's going to be called uh, on the Hang Up on Wednesday. Thursday will be Katie and Dr. Ben again this Thursday on Tacus, the Transatlantic Call In Show. And next Sunday, it'll be me and Jimmy back for the Sunday show. But let me tell you what's going on on Monday's episode of Skep Talk. Someone sent in this message. I will support the show with a $100 super chat if Matt goes an entire show without telling anyone to shut up. I will PM and PM him in Facebook to ensure that he knows about the offer. This came in as a PM uh, just in the last half hour. And I said, sure, I'll take your money, but it's fucking stupid. Uh, pick the show. I'm on Monday, Wednesday, and Sunday next week. And the reply was, I've been called worse. Can you consider the possibility that it isn't stupid? Yes, I can. For an additional $400, you can mention this challenge at the beginning of the show and ask viewers to chime in as to whether or not the challenge is fucking stupid. If you fail the test, you'll get to keep the $400. So only if people in chat agree with me that this is a fucking stupid test, uh, which we'll do tomorrow. So I'll mention this at the beginning of the show. I'm assuming that I'm allowed to, uh, describing this isn't the same thing as actually telling someone to shut up. And as long as I can go the entire show without telling anyone to shut up, and if chat, which I guess we'll do with a poll, can agree that this is a fucking stupid uh, challenge, the show will get $500. Wow. Can you still say stuff like hush and be quiet or are synonyms out? Other than, <laughs> wait a moment, I'll put you on hold. Oh, um, okay. All right. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether we should run the poll right now or we'll run, we'll run the poll tomorrow in conjunction with the show because I don't think it's fair to make a judgment about skept, uh, skept viewers with Sunday viewers. Um, but wait, yeah. wait, hold on. I'll give you $501 to tell that guy to shut up. How about that? On Monday. Shut up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> It's just words, but no, I, I appreciate it. I, I, I think that this person is, is, uh, attempting to use cash to make a very misguided point that they don't fully understand, but I could be wrong. And maybe it's good for me to not tell someone to shut up, uh, when I think they should shut the fuck up, but we'll see because tomorrow that's what we'll do. So I've got the message. We're, we're good to go. Um, Arden, you heard all that, right? You're producing tomorrow, and so you can yep. remind me to announce that. We can set up a poll for it, um, and we'll see if we can earn this channel $500 by saying all sorts of other really fucking offensive things, but not <laughs> shut up, because I guarantee you that's why I'm playing it. Love it. All right. 
Two more calls today. Uh, and by the way, the rest of you are able to donate to this show as well, and not just here. You can, in fact, donate uh, via Super Chats, but you can also go uh, to our Patreon page and support the show. Your donations are what allow us to do these shows uh, because we have a number of people working behind the scenes. We are growing. Uh, the line when I first started here a couple of years ago was doing the hang up along with Jimmy was I think at around 30,000 subscribers or so. We are maybe during this show, there's 1,500 of you watching right now and we are less than 300 away from having 85,000 subscribers on this channel. We're at 84,700. I don't know how many of you are already subscribed, but if you are not subscribed, Click subscribe, ring the bell, give us a thumb up. All of those things genuinely help and they cost you nothing but a moment's time of clicking. And if you subscribe and you uh, ring the bell, you will be doing a, a great deal to support this channel even without having to click on a super chat or donation. We are grateful to all of you for watching, for contributing, for driving calls, for bringing people in to do the show. Um, and while I understand that people have different views on tactics and who should say shut up or fuck you or whatever else um i uh, this is this is my life's work and it doesn't matter um well it matters now but it doesn't matter whether i'm doing the show that i did for 18 and a half years or i'm doing this show the mission remains the same and that is i used to be a fundamentalist southern baptist christian who believed that there was a god and i was convinced that god wanted me to be a preacher and I ran from that calling for a short period of time, and I thought that God punished me. And after I realized, or after I came to that awareness that I thought God was punishing me, I set out to be a good Christian. And it turns out that unless I've done something terribly wrong, the best Christian is an atheist. Because I followed the evidence and found out I didn't have good reason for those beliefs, and the principle of striving to be a better Christian, I wound up as an atheist. Now, if I'm wrong, you're free to call in and make your case for why I'm wrong. I will accept you saying I'm in conflict with what the Bible says. I already know that. I am well aware that I am in many different ways completely in conflict with what the Bible says. But the things that the Bible say, says that are actually important and valuable and, and actually display good character, those things I'm already consistent with. I'm not running around doing harm. As a matter of fact, I'm better than the Bible. I'm better than your God, and so are you. You can also be better than your God. But if you have a belief, if you have good reason for thinking that I'm wrong, that Noah's wrong, that, that the Bible is true, or the Quran is true, although I think we've scared off almost as many Muslims now, Muslim apologists as we have atheists, um, by all means, Call in, present your case. If you do good enough, you can apply to be on End Boss, our new show where we're giving you the biggest opportunity you are likely ever going to get to present your case to a difficult audience, to reach more godless heathens than you are possibly going to reach sitting around chiming in in the chat or running off to your Discord to talk shit about how awful Noah and I are, or how awful Jimmy and I are, or whatever it is else that you're gonna do, like some of these other people who send their little acolytes to call in. But if you call in with garbage arguments or claims that you cannot back up, if I can debunk you while I'm drunk, you're not gonna get on in, boss. Uh, although we won't know because I don't get drunk, but if I think I could debunk you pretty easily while I was drunk, then you're not going to get on end bus. Anyway, Lewis and the Netherlands, an atheist, pronouns are EM, has a question for us. Thank you so much for your patience. Ask away. Of course. Uh, thank you, Matt. So uh, I have a question or, I guess, uh, advice on talking to believers. So sometimes I would talk to religious individuals. Uh, almost that, all of them are, they said, moderate in the sense that they'll uh, accept science and even be non-practicing, but they'll still uh, call themselves uh, believers. Uh, so in a conversation, I know we won't get uh, to a consensus whether if God exists or not, because it's just unknowable and they'll agree. But then the conversation turns around on the proposal of why, why do you hold this belief uh, if there's no real use for it? And sometimes they'll respond with, uh, 
is what gives us uh, morality, right? Uh, and they mean this in a very, very broad sense. It's not uh, even their particular religion that gives them this morality, but any religion they feel is what has this inherent power, I guess, to, to cause the individual to be good, quote unquote. Um, so they will accept naturalism in almost every sense of their lives and believe in science in this way. But when it comes to the field of uh, invisible concepts, such as ethics, they will still attribute it to some uh, supernatural objective source. And to me, this is frustrating because it feels to me as though the through line that you can follow from present to our ancestors, if you say to believe in evolution, is quite clear, right? Uh, clearing how things like objective morals, like doing good and, and not killing and stealing is such a present in our species through natural means. So how is that objective? Almost... Sorry, in what sense? Well, they, they I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to derail. I, I missed part of what you said. My apologies, but you're basically talking. You're you're asking about how to speak to believers about a natural source for objective morals. But what if there no, isn't? I don't believe in objective morals myself. But they will say uh, things like not killing is objective, and it uh, since it's objective, it cannot be natural, which I disagree with. I I think it's just uh, very almost evident how that can come up in evolution that's such a behavior yeah mm -hmm. so they're saying not to not murder is an objective moral and you don't agree with them i i don't i think okay well, i don't agree with them either yeah but i would say um they they refuse to accept let's say that Morality can also come from evolution, such as uh, physical change can. I don't think I don't think morality comes from evolution. Okay, so how how the, would you have this conversation then? Well, Hello? I don't argue for a, an objective source of morality. Morality um, is the result of our subjective minds trying to find the best way to live a life. Yes, I say like what we understand as moral behavior is beneficial behavior, not necessarily objective, but somebody who is say a believer, even though they might not be uh, extremely religious, they say, no, these are um, the reason we've are morally good is because these values are, I don't know, intrinsic to humanity or something. And, and, and even though they also believe in evolution, they somehow separate those two, which is why I find I cannot continue the conversation after that. So sorry, just to, just to clarify, Lewis, you're not talking about people who argue that an individual is going to be more moral because they have a God belief, but rather you're talking about people who say that the very institution of morals could not exist without a God to author them? Yes, is that or correct? some higher, higher power, let's say, yes. Right, right. Yeah, God is a much more loaded term than we need for this. Um, I... I, I like I said, I think that you're handling it from what you're saying correctly, as far as I can tell, uh, which is just to point out, as, as Matt said, that like, you know, there's not really a through line of morality that you can draw um, from the history of society. There's no one thing that you can say, well, you know, everybody always agreed that this was wrong throughout all of history or whatever, um, but that our uh, moral codes which again we, we have to write down right we have to we have to enforce these moral codes which is a real strong argument that they're not intrinsic um but that our societies benefit more and more based on how well we do on this question of what is going to be our agreed upon moral code and therefore there's sort of a social evolution that happens to it so even stepping setting aside biological evolution societies necessarily will evolve to be more moral just because what more moral is just is you know it's just another way of saying what works best as a society but i think that's just yeah, a restatement I, of what your your basic argument. i wouldn't know i wouldn't know if it's biological either but yeah i would say in, in a natural way we can as a species 
have this understanding of this uh, morality, shared morality, that is not objective or dependent on a higher power or anything. But basically, the, the point of uh, conflict is in having this conversation with somebody is that they will believe or support science and evolution and understand it, but they still, some, uh, for some reason, believe this ethics are, are not tied to that. Let's say. I don't believe they're, they're tied like, to that. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that morality and ethics are, are tied to evolution in any meaningful way. Um, when I say that, so I think there are objective assessments that are possible about morality, but the, the goals, the foundations, the morality is about well-being or flourishing or whatever else. those foundations are subjective but once you have those foundations um the assessment of actions with respect to those goals can be done objectively in the same way that the rules of chess are arbitrary but once you have the rules there are moves that are legal and there are moves that are not legal there are also moves that can be shown to get you closer to winning the game uh, or closer to losing the game and so when you say which move is better, we can make an objective assessment of which move is better, even though the rules and the goal are all subjectively arbitrarily made up. Um, evolution is an unguided, mindless process of just things changing. It has no goal and it has no impact. Um, all, we have, all we're doing is saying, if my morality is rooted in the well-being of thinking creatures then i can show objectively that lopping off their head is not in in keeping with their well-being and i can show that uh impaling them on a spike is not in keeping with their best interests and drinking battery acid is not in keeping with their best interests and running around belittling them and intentionally misgendering them and attempting to shame them and attempting to make them feel inferior is not in the best. We can do that for all of those things once we begin with, with the foundation. But if you want to say that the foundation is an objective result of evolution, it, it isn't in any more meaningful sense than we are the result of evolution. But that's like saying that evolution is responsible for um, me liking chocolate ice cream more than vanilla. It, it, it is the process that led to that, but it's not like my relative evaluation of, of how tasty a particular flavor is, is a, a product of evolution, especially since it can be different in different people. I see. Yeah. Basically it's a uh, evolution understanding in this way. It's, uh, the process so it's it's a natural process that leads to a result but the way you explained it is that the objectivity is then sort of a consensus that we have that has this natural source but which includes a social evolution or a social understanding for uh, this final ethical goal of maximizing uh, benefit to thinking beings correct well, I got confused when you said objective and consensus. I think you meant the goal is a product of consensus, in which case I would agree. Yeah. Let, okay. Basically, the understanding of objective, moral, of not not I'm not talking about my position, but the person I would speak with, is is not this um, result. Or consensus but it's like they understand it as a supernatural ex pre-existing truth let's say which i don't agree with so they they have a misunderstanding of object of what objectives uh, entails yeah what happens well, sometimes I, and is i'm that, curious oh sorry sorry go ahead no i was just gonna say what happens sometimes is that they confuse um objective with absolute and that's two different categories, you know, whether or not, whether or not uh, it's absolute versus relative, whether or not it's objective versus subjective, those are slightly different things. But what were you going to add, Noah? Uh, just that I, I'm curious how these people cope with the fact that morality has clearly changed over time. You know, if it's if it's this objective thing written into the heavens or, or you know, written into our, uh, written into creation by, by some 
higher power. Did that higher power get better at it over time or change its mind over time? Like, how did they cope with the changing ethics over over historical epics? I think the answer really is that they don't think that much about it, but mm -hmm. or they reduce it to the bare uh, core aspects, like not killing other humans, but you know it doesn't expand to social well-being or or whatever. They I don't think they uh, would say those are also absolute morals, but it helps a lot uh, that distinguish uh, objective uh, absolute. That helps. That helps me. I, I don't I yeah a, apart from that I don't know that I have any, anything else to add because I'm, I'm just at odds with the people it's like saying how do you how do you argue with somebody who has a fundamentally different starting foundation well you have to set that entire argument aside and talk about the foundation and say okay because I think that no matter what you try to do uh, a good chunk of those people are going to say that morality is uh proceeds from the character and or mind of god and so as long as they have that as the foundation of morality it doesn't matter whether they accept evolution it doesn't matter wh what they think about objective or subjective or absolute or anything else if they are stuck beginning with morality is what proceeds from the the mind and character of god then that's what you've got to deal with first everything else is just you, you're trying to argue three steps down the road Yes, I, I think just to summarize, uh, the difference in the language would be how to convince somebody that uh, this morality then is not absolute, but can be objective through a natural process. How, how would you, what would your argument be in that case? I'm sorry, one more time. If I'm understanding you correctly, my argument would be just the, the, the changing of morality over time. Mm -hmm. So uh, to repeat. How, how would I convince somebody who thinks this morality it can be absolute and detached from humanity or whatever, uh, but instead it can be objective through natural means? I, I don't know. Every conversation can be different. To me, the notion that morals are absolute is, is patently ridiculous. Um, they are absolutely situational. Is it wrong to steal a loaf of bread? Well, yes, you can say as a general rule, it's wrong to steal a loaf of bread. But for example, when Katrina hit, uh, I watched people steal loaves of bread. But those loaves of bread were absolutely going to go to waste and people were starving and floating around in, in water. So the most moral thing you could do at that moment to save your life and the lives of people around you would be to take that loaf of bread that doesn't belong to you. So this is why we have to view morality as with respect to situations and not with respect to absolutes. Um, that said, there are things that for which there is no conceivable likely scenario under which an action would be viewed as moral. For example, owning another human being is property. Uh, I have difficult time conceiving of any situation where it would be morally permissible to own another person as property. I can though conceive of situations where it would be morally permissible to pretend that you own another human being as property because somebody can come up with some, you know, wild scenario where if either you're going to own this person as property or I'm going to kill them, in which case, okay, they're my property, but they're not really. I mean, it, so you have to judge everything based on the situation. It's just that it doesn't always require a whole lot of work because how many situations are there where someone could cut someone else's head off and it isn't viewed as immoral? I, I'm not aware of too many. Um, I, I'm not even convinced that many of the ones we, we generally look at and go, yes, that's just like, you know, we're going to execute a tyrant by cutting off their head. Maybe that's still not moral, but even as close as we could get to that being moral, it's still situational because it's they cutting, you know, killing, Saddam Hussein um, versus for, for what he did or didn't do versus killing me for what I did or didn't do. Those, are, those aren't the same situations. And while I'm opposed to the death penalty um, on a number of different grounds, I understand it. And if somebody who slaughtered a family of four gets killed, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time crying about it uh, or, or thinking that it w wasn't uh, just. But that's also because I considered the situation. 
So I don't understand the people who are saying that there are moral absolutes. But on that note, I apologize, but we we got to move on. I got a couple other callers. We're running out of time. Oh, of course, thank you so much. It's a complicated uh, problem, but thank you. You helped me. Yeah, we can we can dig in another time. Thanks, Lewis. All right, um, this this is going to be fun. Uh, Dimitri in Nebraska, opponents of him, is a theist who has new evidence for God that has something to do with ghosts. So, Dimitri, you're on the Sunday show on the line. Welcome. Hey guys, how you guys doing? Pretty good. Doing great, man. Awesome. I have a quick question for Matt right before I go into my, you know, my main question. Um, Matt, in your uh, debate happened um, earlier this year with uh, Kenny Bomber, the Muslim. Quick question. Yeah. Um, what were your What were your thoughts when he was making a? He put heavy emphasis on, you know, all things, all living, all cells consist or are made up of. Um, water and depends on water it, it seemed like he was conflating the two consisting of something and made up of something is the same thing but you pointed out there's a distinction what, what were your thoughts on that i was just curious i'm pretty sure i gave my thoughts right there in the debate and in the debate review but his view like many other muslims is that the quran says that everything is made of water or made from water and it's just a fact that's not what everything's made from right okay okay Nice. Yeah, I, I yeah, did check the out fact, his, uh, the, the fact his... that the fact that a cell has water. Water is the stuff in the cell that isn't the cell. The, the cell right. is the cellular material, and the fact that there's water in there—that's the non-cell part. It'd be like saying um, my house is made up of books because there's books in here, or my house is made up of oxygen because there's oxygen in here. That's that's the level of silliness. Okay. Right. Yeah, so we watched it. We watched it live. We were there, and when we seen his review, it was just uh, he was emphasizing that point again, like just trying to hammer it. And it just it didn't make sense. Like 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 he's trying to conflict it too, and it's like he didn't get your point during the debate, and after the debate, you know, he emphasized that. So it seemed like he was trying to be desperate and push hard that you were incorrect, but it was a clear distinction. So okay, no worries. Cool. So my question to you, Matt, um, is that. I want you to consider uh, an argument regarding paranormal activity. So regarding what there are you, you broke up you broke uh, up for just a second. Okay, regarding paranormal activity, how do we know what? Yes, well, I mean, go ahead. I'll, I'll ask the I'll ask the questions afterwards. What's the argument? Okay, so the argument overall is paranormal activity can show potentiality for the existence of God. So that's the overall argument how it can lead to uh, potential evidence to the existence of God. So the argument is that when you evaluate or consider evidence from paranormal investigators and in societies regarding um, apparitions, EVPs, uh, smiles, um, personal experiences, which I don't put weight on, but personal experiences taken into consideration and you get four out of the five senses when you take these in total and you evaluate um multiple reports from established societies and you take that into consideration from a christian from a christian worldview though specifically christian then that seems to lend credence that okay well there's potentially spirits well, there's that problem. exist and from a, okay so let me uh yeah, you, i'm almost done so okay. I'm going to continue on just so you get the full front and then you can respond. And so and from that point, from a worldview, is that from a Christian, we believe in that our spirits exist. And these things are based on scripture that we have possessed. And therefore, if spirits exist in which our scripture speaks about total, there's a possibility that the same evidence or the, the same things that are spoken about as spirits so on and so forth, then there's possibly evidence for a God. Now, you said real quick on the first point that there's my problem. Um, go ahead, elaborate. Well, I when I said there's your problem, you said if you begin with a Christian worldview. You don't get to begin with a Christian worldview. If I get to begin with a Christian worldview, I'm done. If I begin with a Christian worldview, then clearly there's a God. Right, so... So you I don't get I'm to begin... From 
No, 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 you don't get to argue from a Christian worldview because I don't have a Christian worldview. You might as well, if, if you argue from a worldview I don't share, then we're never, ever, 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 ever going to reach agreement. So you have to argue from a neutral standpoint, evidence that should convince someone who's not convinced. If you're only going to argue from the standpoint of evidence that will convince those that are already convinced, you're wasting everybody's time. So you start with, what about paranormal activity? How do you know that anything that has been claimed to be paranormal in origin or supernatural in origin is in fact paranormal or supernatural in origin? My, my, my response to you is that I agree with you that we don't have to start from a Christian worldview. And the question you asked is a great starting point. It's neutral, right? So my response to you would be simple. You take the totality of paranormal investigators and the reports that they have, and you take that in totality reports, you see if there's any um, repetition, right? If there's any repetition of this. So let me give you a quick example before I elaborate specifically on what you just said. So just to make a, like a little pinpoint to help you give an example, uh, let's just say there's a specific house that's alleged to be having activity of paranormal activity. And let's just say there's evidence that multiple paranormal societies have been to the house, set up their tests, their EVPs. There's, so everything I just mentioned to you as far as video recordings, pictures, um, audio recordings, so on and so forth is documented, but not by just one group, multiple groups over a period of time. And there's consistency regarding audio recordings of something when nothing is there. So on and so How forth. How do you know nothing is there? Okay. Okay, stop, stop, Demetri. I can't take any more. I asked, how do you tell that a proposed paranormal or supernatural event is in fact paranormal or supernatural in origin. It doesn't matter if 50,000 paranormal investigators walk in with their bullshit meters to detect something, even if they've detected something, you then have to show that the something they detected is in fact paranormal. How do you do that? Well, you rule it out based on probability. Matt, as you know. No, 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 no. That how is it that I can ask structured questions about foundational ideas like epistemology? Shut up. Like foundational ideas like epistemology, and you just come back with, well, you just rule it out. I'm asking okay, what I, methodology? I, I Stop talking I until I'm done. Matt, I'm I can asking. Elaborate in the detail. I'm. With respect. I swear you interrupt can, me one more fucking time, and I'm hanging up on you. I'm asking, how can you tell that, a, that an audio recording that some ghost hunter recorded is in fact supernatural in origin, period? Question mark. Can I answer now? May I answer, please? Yeah, man, go ahead. May I answer? I think he needs your permission too, Matt. I I I don't have the authority apparently. Noah already said you can answer. I mean, Give I us an answer. May I answer the question? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I don't. All right, Matt. So it's a great question. It's a great question you're asking, but I don't take that audio recording in isolation. My specific question was in totality of the evidence. So it's not just audio from one right, but, group. It's but, audio but from multiple investigators in conjunction with video evidence and pictures and testimony. And in that basis... Well, you're adding okay. zeros together, though. You can multiply by as many zeros as you want. You still have zero. You have to establish that each of these pieces of information is actually meaningful. And what Matt's asking is how do you know, like, with, with, let's let's... Just use EVP, and we can go down the list. Every piece of information that you're talking about is nonsense. It's it's it doesn't actually measure anything. It can't be shown to measure anything. Um, so if one of them is meaningless, then six of them are also meaningless. But I asked, what methodology would confirm that something is supernatural in origin? 
And your answer is that you don't just take the audio recording, you take all of it in totality. That is not a methodology. It cannot ever be a methodology to establish that something is supernatural in origin. In the entire history of the world, while people have claimed that things are supernatural in order, no, in, in origin, no one has ever demonstrated that anything supernatural exists or that it can be the origin of any phenomenon that we experience. I'm asking, what methodology can you demonstrate that shows that a, an audio recording is in fact supernatural in origin? How do you prove that? Go. All right, man. So you're not going to accept what I said. So you might have a point. There's no methodology, but you did make the question saying there's no evidence in history that paranormal activity has existed. So, okay, shut up again. I'm going to say shut up a whole bunch today. It has nothing to do with Dimitri. It has to do with some smug prick who thinks he wants <coughs> me to not say shut up. So I want to get money from him tomorrow. So, um, you came back with, I'm not going to address what you said. That's a lie. I did address what you said. You're the one that's dodging because you're not able to present a methodology. And then when you say that I said in the entire history of the world, no demonstration has ever been made that there's actually something supernatural, that is actually true. There has been no, dem there have been plenty of claims about the supernatural, but there is no demonstrable recognized method that demonstrates that something is in fact supernatural in order. And the way to prove that wrong would be for you to present one. That's how you falsify my claim. Go ahead. Yeah, man. So can you read the last part? There was a beep. So I didn't hear the last part. Can you please repeat the last part? The last part was just go ahead. Yeah, right before that. To, what, what did you say to disprove your claim? I didn't, I didn't hear that part. You what give a demonstrate. You give a demonstration of a methodology th that confirms something that is necessarily supernatural in origin. If I say there are no black swans, yes, that would be a black swan fallacy, but it's falsifiable because all you have to do is show a black swan and all of a sudden it's proven wrong. In the entire history of the world, no one has demonstrated that anything is actually supernatural in origin. If they had, it would be a functional part of scientific inquiry, and they would have received a Nobel Prize for demonstrating that something is supernatural. This is why I asked, what is the methodology that demonstrates that something is supernatural? Something you have consistently failed to demonstrate. So one more try, either give me a methodology that confirms the supernatural or move on. Okay, here's my response to you, which I mentioned earlier. Number one, of course, I disagree. Then I don't need to hear it again. Then I don't need to hear it. No, I don't need to hear it again if you said it before. Why would you say yeah. the same thing again? I'm giving you a different answer, Matt. Matt. Repetition. Well, no, you just said you said before. How is it a different answer if you said it before? Because I think you missed it. I said repetition. So when, if you're going to prove something. Repetition confirms consistent experience. It does not confirm origin. I can see 5,000 things that look the same and not know what the fuck their origin is. If I see 5,000 yeah, things, shut up, shut up, shut up. No, you shut up, man. You employ probability. Is that something right, paranormal bitch, or goodbye. not? Goodbye. I'm going to mute you and you're going to sit there and fucking shut up and listen. I can see 5,000 things that, oh, you're going to hang up. You little fucking coward. Go away. I can see 5,000 things that look identical and everybody around me can say, let's call that a ghost. And we would all be in agreement that we now have a consistent identifiable phenomenon. We could pull up EVP recordings from 5,000 ghost hunters, including video that all say the same, Ooh, I'm a ghost and show the exact same exact same face and everything else and that would be consistency in what people are reporting as the experience and it would not tell you at all what the origin is how do you tell the difference between that being a real supernatural ghost versus some technology that you aren't aware of that's the problem and this is why you are not ready to have these conversations because you sit there and ignore the questions being asked because you don't understand the very basic groundwork of epistemology about how you tell the difference between reality and fiction, which is why you still believe in God. Okay. I'm, I'm back.
I got to say, I, you know, honestly, like, so first of all, the, he's talking about probability. The probability is zero. No, nothing supernatural has ever been proven to exist. So the probability that the answer to any question is it's supernatural is zero, given what we know uh, to begin with. And again, it's so far from proving the point that he wants to prove, because I've I've read quite a bit of Christian theology, nowhere near as much as you, Matt, and I have yet to find anything in Christian theology that would explain a a disembodied ghost wandering around a house going, ooh, like that, again, doesn't even fit with your worldview. So you're like failing to prove a point that wouldn't even prove the point you want to prove. It's it's just, it's incredible. Yeah. We're going to take one more call. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to take Russ in Montana. Brian, I apologize. You got in uh, kind of after my cutoff, but call back another time. I know you've got some, uh, Yeah, this this uh, this this flat Earth thing. We'll we'll do it another time. Maybe maybe save that call. Call in for Skep Talk, Brian. Uh, I appreciate your time, but I've got to take one more call, and then we're going to wrap this all up. Russ in Montana, an atheist pronouns are he him. Wants to talk a little bit about consciousness and where religion comes from, because that's an easy topic we can we can smash in like two or three minutes. I'm sure. We absolutely can, Matt. And hello to you and Noah and Greg and the great uh, screener there, very polite. Very helpful. Um, yeah. yeah, consciousness. Uh, yeah. Caller, real quick. Um, well, the, let's start first with the brain, the mind. Hang, hang on a second. Yeah, I'm, I'm Arden, not sure you... the caller can hear me, but his mic is incredibly low. So if you could tell him to speak more closely to his microphone or something, that would be great. Right. So in case you couldn't hear our producer, Russ, uh, if you can lean into your mic or speak up a little bit it's it's very difficult to hear you so we'll try again how about this is this better hello? A, a little bit but we'll, we'll try go ahead oh, um, oh now now i can't understand you at all okay um i don't understand why um just i'm on the phone and and now it's, it's hard scratchy. To hear me. Yeah, it's and now it's scratchy. Oh my word. I, don't know. I apologize, Russ. I, I apologize, Russ. Yeah. I you send us an email or try to call back in or maybe use the, the link on a computer on another day, but I gotta let you go. Uh because just just can't make heads or tails of what you're saying. So in that sense, um YouTube channel. Brian, are you there? I am. We'll, yes, we'll try is. to take your. We'll try to take yours really quick. I was going to take a different call, but their audio was all messed up. So, what was it you wanted to address? Oh well, I, I just think that it's uh, important to uh, broadcast the logic lesson uh, when people like the G Georgia uh, GOP chair Candace Taylor asserts that the widespread depictions of the Earth as a globe show that there is a government conspiracy to deny a flat Earth. Um, uh, you know, people obviously need to uh, maintain their beliefs in the spite of in spite of uh, good evidence. Um, I, I, I one friend brought this up, and I said to him, and he brought it up as a, a sign of critical thinking. And I said, well, by that logic, uh, the widespread appearance of flat road flat road maps would be a government conspiracy to deny that the Earth is a globe. <laughs> so, you know, uh, yeah. Um, so I, I, I just thought since you, you have a number of listeners and I had only one, maybe you want to, uh, give this, uh, th give this person a logic lesson. It, it gets scary when people in power start, uh, you know, describing this bullshit. Well, I don't think I can give her a logic lesson cause she's not watching and clearly hasn't paid attention to anything, um, reasonable on this in a while. Um, but yeah, what's embarrassing to me is that, um, once upon a time people, I'm, I'm going to actually let you go, Brian, but I'll answer this off air and then, and then move on. But thank you for, for that calling in with that. Um, I remember when I was a kid, scientists were generally revered. And if somebody said, hey, what's the latest finding from science? It was like, ooh, that's, that's cool. And now it's like, oh, I don't believe that. And in part, there's been a misinformation campaign, which is this notion that because we continually learn new things from science, that this means that somehow science is changing, which means that science is unreliable. Um, the truth is, of course, that the findings of science um, are updated 
they are always tentative and what they're doing is being refined so that they are consistently trending towards more accurate and eventually hopefully most accurate um whereas religious claims don't change they're rigid and wrong and silly um but whether or not the earth was flat it doesn't really matter it's what these people are rejecting isn't scientific evidence or fact it is a conspiracy theory model where they aren't yes. going to trust the government they aren't going to trust the authorities they aren't going to trust anything that is uh, in any way challenging to whatever paradigm they've already accepted it doesn't matter what evidence it doesn't matter that we've taken pictures of the earth from the moon they got to deny that start making a list of all the things that they have to deny in order to get to a flat earth uh, and you'll find that they're going to deny critical aspects of reality. It's baffling to me that anybody seriously believes that the earth is more likely flat than round in this day and age. But what's shocking isn't that not only is it seemingly increasing in popularity or at least far more popular than you expect it to be, but that some of these people get elected to office. But with people like Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, who neither one of them, I think, are flat earthers, and yet they're still two of the dumbest people who have ever been elected to public office, right up there with Donald Trump, um, it doesn't surprise me that some of these people believe the earth is flat. If you begin with bad ideas like that, I don't know what a believing in a flat earth impacts in your policy-making decision, but I find it really hard to believe that people who think the earth is flat are likely to be making reasonably informed decisions about medicine, vaccines, bodily autonomy. Um, luckily, this person I don't think is in uh, an elected position in the way where, where they're making uh, decisions um, the way a representative would, but I can't give her a logic lesson. She doesn't have the tools to understand it to begin with, and she's not listening. Um, and I don't know exactly what she said. So despite the fact that she went on a rant about fat, uh, flat earth stuff, I didn't listen to it. And so I can't really fully properly critique something that I, I haven't listened to. I can tell you why I, it's ridiculous to conclude the earth's flat, but I don't know. On that, we're, we're closing in on nearly three hours. And I ended, a, ended the calls because I want to spend the last couple of minutes here before we wrap up noah first of all huge thank you for coming in and doing the show and hanging out with us all this time take the take a minute here to tell people where to find you what you're working on all of the god-awful movies the puzzle and the thunderstorm everything else how do they find you when you're not here having fun with me well, Matt, thanks so much for, for inviting me on. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, thanks for working, working with me through some audio issues as well. I know my audio isn't exactly as crisp and clean uh, as we would all like it to be. So thanks to the to the viewers for uh, for bearing with me there as well. Um, and thanks for man, making two hours and 48 minutes just roll by like nothing. I was really shocked when, when you started saying these were the last calls. Um, Oh, uh, but yeah, I do a couple of podcasts. The Scathing Atheist is a uh, topical news show where we talk about uh, what's in the news uh, as atheists. We try to be as irreverent as possible about it because otherwise it's super, super depressing. Uh, we do a show called God Awful Movies where we do weekly reviews of Christian cinema uh, so that you don't have to watch the movies to know what kind of poisonous messages they're sneaking into them. Uh, we also do a show called uh, The Skeptograph, which is a more of a political show. Uh, and uh, we do Citation Needed, which is uh, just a fun little trivia show that we do with some friends. Uh, and just because we wanted to make sure that we had as many shows as you, uh, we also have a fifth one now uh, called D&D Minus, where we, uh, where we play D&D together and just have a blast. If you're looking for something that's Ooh. not as um, ripping your hair out type of thing, D&D Minus is a ton of fun. Uh, my friend Eli Bosnick. Uh, host that show. He is a comic genius uh, who is on, honestly, I think, on par with anybody working in Hollywood or in stand up. And uh, he always does a fantastic job with that. So uh, just check out skatingatheist.com. Uh, there's a couple links, I think, to Skating Atheist and God Awful Movies on the uh, description for this as well. Uh, I have loved Eli for many, many years and uh, hopefully gets a chance to watch this. I miss you, buddy. Um, 
life got in the way where Eli and I didn't get to interact for a number of years and he had a kid and then COVID and you know, all, all this stuff's going on. Uh, so I miss him and all you guys, hopefully we will all find ourselves at an atheist convention or secular convention or skeptic convention or some other fucking fun convention that maybe has nothing to do with any of that crap at some point uh, in yeah, the near future. Yeah, we these snake shows with you. Yeah, that could be fun. Yeah, you guys come down whenever you want. You, know, you can just go in the other room and have a snake show. There's like 50 yeah, right. of them down the hall. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I go to a lot of reptile conventions um, when I'm not doing other stuff. As a reminder, I will be at the Psycho Student Alliance National Convention uh, here in mid-June, the, the weekend of the 17th, 18th, something like that, uh, doing the Magic and Skepticism show at the uh, dinner, which your uh, your compatriot there, uh, Heath, was brought up on stage during the version of that that I did American Atheist and legitimately gave the best reaction I think I can remember getting in years when uh, when I had him draw a picture and then duplicated it. Uh, I, I think he thought it was going to be a joke and then he just kind of sat there <laughs> staggered, which was awesome. I, I, live, I live for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Thanks everybody for tuning in today. Thank you to uh, Dragon for uh, screening the calls, to Arden for being the awesome producer, to Cookies and all of our other moderators who've been keeping things lively in chat and making sure that they don't get too lively, letting people know, hey, you can call in and you should call in and you'll get time provided you actually answer the question. But if you are not ready, that's cool. That's, it's great that you recognize that, but you can still call in and ask questions. And as long as you're honest and saying, hey, here's what I think and here's why, everything's going to go fine. But when we're asking questions, we're asking them for a reason. And if we're unable to get you to, to ask the question, that's also fine unless you want to avoid asking the question while continuing down a path. The way back and forth conversations are supposed to go is that somebody makes a point and the other person either acknowledges it or counters it or tables it. But if you make a point and it gets countered and you ignore it to go on to your next point, why didn't you start with the next point first? Start with your best argument. Don't start with the one five down and say, oh, but when that one gets rebutted, I've got another one. No, nah. bring your A game. Start with the top of it. Tomorrow we'll be doing Skep Talk, me and Apologia, and I will not be telling anybody to shut up so that not only will we get at least $100, but assuming you guys agree with my poll that this is a fucking stupid uh, 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 at attempt uh, we, we may get as much as $500 for the channel as well. Tuesday will be Dying Out Loud with Dave Warnock and Aaron Lewis. I'll be back on Wednesday with uh, Apostasy on The Hang Up, and Katie and Ben will be on Transatlantic Colin Show on Thursday. Next week, Jimmy and I will be back doing this here. Please take care of yourself. Vote if you're eligible to vote. Participate. Let people know if you are able to, that you are a skeptic, that you are a humanist, that you are an atheist, if those labels apply or whatever labels apply because many many people who are reasonable who don't believe in a flat earth who aren't going to accept a ghost story just because they saw three different people get the same evp uh thing who are actually going to look into the science of evp and find out that it's nonsense and bullshit who are going to in, go to a skeptics convention and find out that wow all this stuff that i used to believe turns out no good reason to believe any of it and we have no methodology to verify the supernatural that it's something people just take on faith and yet they are cocksure and overconfident that their beliefs match reality if you get to a point where you are open about who you are and what you think it makes it easier for everybody else who is marginalized who agrees with you or who is marginalized who you support and so if you have any platform be it a show like this or just an opportunity to reach out to other people to let them know hey woke isn't an insult hey trans rights are human rights hey i'm atheist and i'm not a baby killing monster set on destroying the world as far as you know all of those things go a long way to making the world a better place we'll see you next time take care song i've heard it before but i don't know it i can know it and not know it at the same time screw logic